Welcome to the central premises of the European Public Law Organization. As you have seen, we have been located by Greek authorities in a public building, which was ceded to us, between the Roman Agora and the Athenian Agora. And uh, this was in order to be reminded that we are a place where democracy was born and where the state was introduced by the Romans. So we have here on our left side democracy. Well, you know, the Greeks, instead of working, they were every day in the end discussing. It. And uh, the main issue was that everybody is equal to everybody. And uh, so uh, that brought democracy. And then the Romans came and they built the Roman Agora, uh, reminding us that they introduced the uh, science of, of law, the uh, strict understanding of the law, and uh, the concept of state. Uh, we, the Greeks, have invented uh, everything in political science and uh, governance except uh, perhaps the state, uh, the rule of law, and uh, never forget that dictatorship. Dictatorship was a Roman uh, institution, which flourished after that, you see, after the Romans. Anyway, uh, we are very honored uh, to have uh, today with us the global initiative against transnational organized crime and to have all of you who came from other countries to uh, uh, to uh, mix up uh, with uh, the nationals of our headquarters, the Greeks and uh, the students and everyone to discuss with uh, your own competence and uh, uh, your own uh, um, uh, distinguished uh, uh, results of life and of study. Uh, the um, teaching organized crime and corruption courses, actually anti-organized crime and anti-corruption uh, courses in Southeast Europe. Please allow me, however, on a personal note, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to welcome each one of the participants, uh, but especially uh, Ambassador Ugi Zvekic, uh, Ambassador Ugi Zvekic, uh, uh, Zvekic is a very important person for the world, for his country, but also for this institution, the European Public Law Organization. He is our permanent observer in uh, to the United Nations in Vienna, and he does an excellent job, uh, which honors this institution, representing us on a daily basis and giving us all the science, which is his uh, in representing, uh, when, when representing the APLO uh, to the United Nations and the region. We thank him very much. And actually, I don't have the custom of taking the floor uh, in every uh, meeting that we have in this institution. Uh, he is the one who represents the EPLO today in this uh, uh, activity. But uh, I took the floor uh, in order to say thanks. Thank you, Ugi. Thank you very much for everything that you do for the EPLO. Uh, and uh, thank you for being here with us. Thank, thank you for having brought the global initiative against transnational organized crime here. Thank you very much. And uh, and I wouldn't miss the opportunity to also thank a younger former student, colleague now of mine, uh, uh, Professor Zivas, who brought Ugis Vekic into the EPLO. <laughs> thank you very much indeed.
Thank you, Professor Flogaitis, for your kind words. Um, we are very, very fortunate to be hosting today's event at the premises of EPLO here in Plaka, next to the Athenian and the Roman Agora, as you just heard. This is a place of historical importance. And um, it's also so important to host a conference about teaching uh, organized crime and anti-corruption courses. Um, within the framework of an international organization with, which has education in its core and offers educational programs and undergraduate and postgraduate degrees as well. Um, allow me, um, before giving the word to Ambassador Ugis Vekic, um, to address uh, this conference on behalf of the head of the Hellenic Police, uh, General Konstantinos Kumas, uh, who couldn't join us today, but he has asked me um, to uh, speak on his behalf and say a few words. This is, will be in Greek because what I have been sent is in Greek, so excuse my Greek, it won't be long. Αξιότιμε κυρίε και κύριοι, δυστυχώ για λόγου υπηρεσιακού δεν κατέστη εφικτό να βρίσκομαι μαζί σα στο Διεθνέ Επιστημονικό Συνέδριο που ασχολείται με ένα θέμα τόσο επίκαιρο όσο ποτέ άλλοτε, όπω είναι η αντιγκληματική πολιτική. Σε ένα ρευστό περιβάλλον που χαρακτηρίζεται από ραγδαίε εξελίξει, αλματώδη αλλαγέ και ιδιάζουσε κοινωνικέ συνθήκε παγκοσμίω, καλούμαστε όλοι, κράτη, αστυνομία, αρμόδιοι φορεί και αρχέ, να ανταποκριθούμε στι νέε προκλήσει αξιόπιστα και αποτελεσματικά. Πρωταρχική σημασία στόχο κάθε συντεταγμένη κοινωνία καθίσταται όχι μόνο η καταστολή, αλλά πρωτίστω η πρόληψη του εγκλήματο. Στο πλαίσιο αυτό, η εκπαίδευση και η κατάρτιση, η μελέτη και η έρευνα, ο σχεδιασμό και η υλοποίηση εξειδικευμένων προγραμμάτων αποτελούν το πιο σημαντικό πνευματικό κεφάλαιο για την ανάπτυξη τη νέα γενιά πολιτικών και στρατηγικών στόχων για την πρόληψη και την αντιμετώπιση του εγκλήματος σε εθνικό, ευρωπαϊκό και διεθνές επίπεδο. Η αστυνομία, με διαρκή ανάλυση των κινδύνων και των απειλών που συνθέτουν το τοπίο της εγκληματικότητας στην Ελλάδα και διεθνώς, χαράσει το νέο πλαίσιο των στρατηγικών κατευθύνσεων με στόχο την προστασία του πολίτη και την εμπέδωση του αισθήματος ασφάλειας στην κοινωνία. Με αυτές τις σκέψεις συγχαίρω τους διοργανωτές του συνεδρίου και εύχομαι καλή επιτυχία στις εργασίες του ο αντιστράτηγος, ο αρχηγός της ελληνικής αστυνομίας. So this was a, a very brief uh, welcoming note uh, by the head of uh, uh, the Hellenic uh, police. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, uh, we will be discussing today education in anti-corruption and organized crime. Allow me uh, to draw your attention to the United Nations Convention Against Corruption uh, and also to the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, actually, a group under the auspices of the United Nations, UNODC, is with us here today, the academic group, uh, which uh, fosters and um, promotes uh, the UNCAC. Article 13 of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption provides for participation of society, so civil society organizations. And allow me to read para one, case C, which reads, each state party shall take appropriate measures within its means and in accordance with fundamental principle of its domestic law to promote the active participation of individuals and groups inside the public sector, such as civil society, non-governmental organizations, and community-based organizations. This participation should be strengthened by such measures as undertaking public information activities that contribute to non-tolerance of corruption, as well as, and be careful, public education programs, including school and university curricula. So what we do today is actually provided for in the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. It is education, it is prevention, and it is a mandate given by the international community to member states and anti-corruption authorities as well to promote anti-corruption and fighting organized crime through education. So having said this, I think uh, I should give the floor um, to the person who is actually uh, the spirit uh, behind today's, today's gathering, as Professor Flogaitis very rightfully pointed out, Ambassador Uglesia Ugi Svekic, a senior advisor of the European Public Law Organization and a senior advisor of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Dear Ugi, you have the floor.
thank you very much for, first of all, for these kind words, for the welcoming on the part of Professor Florigatis and of course on the part of <coughs> Professor Ziovas. And then as you have heard, we are all, you know, in the spirit of, I think, Southeastern Europe, we are all friends, you know. Dimitris brought me here, Spiros became a friend, you know, I have all of you, you know, <laughs> here. So I'm very glad. I think this spirit is very good for our region and this is something that we should keep up. I think that's probably much more important than what we are going to do here today, though I'm not trying to say that what we are going to do is not important at all. But I think, you know, cherishing these good relations in the region is of extreme importance for the future of young generations that we are teaching. And I think that is what we are here about, to prepare ourselves to provide better services to young generations. And that is, I think, the main aim of this um, colloquium that we are um, having here. Of course, uh, as you have heard, I, I have an honor and pleasure to represent uh, EPLO uh, in, in Vienna. And indeed, I'm trying in, in doing that to stick to the mission of EPLO. And the mission of EPLO is to promote European and universal values through public law and governance in a dialogue between civilizations. This is a very important mission. And I think also this, what we are doing here is part of fulfillment of this mission. I also have the honor and pleasure to be the senior advisor of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. So this is how we are together. And that is a very, very important, I, I think, uh, um, uh, way to, to work together. We are also very glad to have here uh, the National uh, uh, Transparency Authority of Greece. And then of course, uh, represented by my dear friend, Dimitris, um, uh, the university, which is co-organizing this meeting um, uh, with us. Um, we are also partially since Dimitris already uh, uh, referred to that, uh, also implementing a memorandum of understanding that uh, UNODC and EPLO signed in Abu Dhabi at the COSP conference in December 2019 about educational activities. And this is exactly that. And we have here, and I'm very glad to welcome him, the representative of UNODC, and he will take a, a floor. Um, uh, later. I would also like to say <clears throat> that this colloquium is devoted to a memory of our dear friend and colleague Dimitri Vlasis, uh, the high level United Nations official from Greece, our host country, and his legacy in multilateral justice, and in the particular in the development and the implementation of United Nations Convention Against Corruption is of the highest value and standards. Dimitri was the founder of the academic anti-corruption uh, ACAD that Dimitri has uh, referred uh, to, as well as of the International Anti-Corruption Excellence Award. And we have here among us also members of ACAD, as well as three winners of the award that you will have a chance uh, also to meet here. Uh, at the end of this session, we will pay a tribute to the memory of Dimitri celebrated by Dr. Eduardo Vettere on behalf of the award uh, community. Um, and in the presence of Dimitri's wife and son, um, Yanis, who actually has organized this meeting. Um, both, uh, Untok and Unkak, so these two mega anti-crime conventions call for important role of education. Dimitris has cited Unkak, the same provision is there in, uh, in Untok. But yet, as we know, these two conventions don't speak to each other. They are divorced for a long time. From the very beginning, they have been divorced. And this is our mission to bring them together. One of the ways to bring them together is to, in teaching, 
to bring them together. And this is, I think, one of the main objectives of this uh, uh, um, colloquium, because it's teaching anti-organized crime, as Piros has said, and anti-corruption, but from the perspective of their interlinkages. They are indeed so much uh, linked and we should resist this bureaucratic division separation that for a variety of political and administrative reasons has been imposed, but there is a way and there are now efforts to bring them together. Indeed, we just came back from the uh, Conference of State Parties of uh, United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, and we had there a side event that EPLO has uh, hosted together with GI Talk and Transparency International, and we pushed for this uh, harmonization between the two conventions, and there are, there are very serious attempts from a number of member states to do it. So we are very glad uh, as an intergovernmental organization, EPLO, as the two, I would say, leading international NGOs, GI Talk in, 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 the, in the case of organized crime and Transparency International in case of uh, corruption, to be together and to promote this um, idea. So um, I really don't want to speak uh, too much uh, about uh, all of this to say that, of course, our challenges are important, responsibilities, as I mentioned, to students and society is even more important. And we had uh, <clears throat> uh, this year in May, also thanks to Sun Chana, who is here present, in Shibenik, we had a high level meeting of the ministers of justice of Western Balkans hosted by the Minister of Justice of Croatia, another very important regional uh, gathering in which GI Talk played the most important uh, role. And the conclusions uh, uh, of this Shibenik meeting uh, are, among other things, the civil society and academia in particular play an ever increasing role in the culture of integrity, as we called it, uh, as the whole of the society approach against organized crime and corruption. Uh, I uh, assume that this program is maybe too intensive for you to enjoy all the beauties of Athens. And this is a problem, but I still hope that you will find after the sessions are over, some time to visit, of course, we are above us the most important uh, uh, place. As uh, uh, Spiros has pointed out, we are here in the midst of the um, um, uh, antique uh, classical uh, democracy and of course civilization. And I think that we should profit uh, from it spiritually, but also in our uh, experiences. So thank you very much for coming. And I wish all of us all the best and nice work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it was supposed to be our director for Southern Eastern Europe who was here uh, introducing on behalf of GI, but you've got me instead, the director of academic engagement, which I, I think what has been said so far indicates that probably I'm not too far out of place, um, given this link between uh, academia and, and the discussions we're having here today. Um, so I just want to, uh, on behalf of GI, say a few formal thank yous. So firstly, uh, well, thank you to ELPO, uh, or sorry, the EPLO. Uh, it's been a terrific partnership. It's a very important partnership for our organization. Um, so, so we're very glad uh, to be part of it. I also have to join the chorus and say thank you to Ambassador Ogi. Um, this would not be possible without him. Um, he has, he's done hugely important work for our organization in building uh, our networks throughout Southeastern Europe. Um, and without his... Um, as somebody described it last night, his friendship approach to doing it um, and his really uh, tenacious driving uh, our work in Southeastern Europe, I don't think we would be as engaged as we are. So I think we owe him a, a debt of gratitude. Um, I also want to add a thank you to Yanis, uh, who has, dare I say, single-handedly pulled so much of this together and has, has really been a credit to GI. So I think we're, we're very appreciative of his work. 
And then lastly, thank you to everybody who's taken the time to come here today. Uh, people who have traveled from overseas, uh, people who have come locally, I think it's, it's a full room. So it's, it's indicative, I think, of how interesting this topic is. Um, so to, to speak from my perspective within GI, this, this workshop is absolutely central to our mission. Um, I would say that given my role, but I, I really think it's true. Um, my role within the organization is building strategic partnerships between universities, civil societies, governments around the world. Um, and, and so we do this in all regions. We do it in Latin America, we do it in Asia, we do it in Africa but, and, and, and Southeastern Europe. But when I joined GI two years ago, what became apparent to me is Southeastern Europe is very advanced. And we have these incredible networks and groups that are linking together and these discussions underway. So it's, it's, it's really something that I think fits very well within GI's mission and something that we are going to continue and are very keen to support. Just to say, GI is also home to the International Association for the Study of Organized Crime uh, and the Journal of Illicit Economies and Development, which if you haven't heard, it's, a, it's an open access peer review academic journal, which we publish in partnership uh, with the London School of Economics Press. So, so to note one of the things that we, and one of the reasons I was brought into GI is that we recognize uh, that there is too often silos between academia on the one hand uh, and civil society and governments on the other hand. And so really what we're trying to do is serve as a bridge uh, between academia, civil society and policy uh, and, and really connect the, the various fields together in, in different forms. So in that lineage and in that goal, uh, we think that the work that we're undertaking here for the next two days is hugely important. And I, I for one, am really, really excited uh, to see the discussions and to be part of them. So I will leave it at that, but thank you very much. So here I am once again. Uh, my name is Dimitris Yuvas, as you just heard. I represent today Pandion University of Athens and uh, my institute, the European Center for Criminal Justice, which is located within Pandion University of Athens. I have the honor of being the director of that uh, institute. Um, at Pandion University of Athens, we do teach, and I see a lot of students of mine, undergraduate and postgraduate here today, we do teach, and I personally teach, anti-corruption courses, so corruption crimes as such at undergraduate and postgraduate level, and also organized crime courses. Uh, and I will have the honor later today to present my book on organized crime with over 1,000 pages. Um, it is so important uh, for the academic community to join forces. It is so important to build networks of teaching uh, anti-organized crime and anti-corruption uh, courses, because education, as you have just heard, is at the center uh, of um, anti-crime efforts. Um, it is so important as well to have organizations like GI Talk who conduct research and who have a very big pool of experts on organized crime and anti-corruption to join forces with universities and with educational uh, organizations because teaching nowadays should be research-led and this is something that we try to do at Pandion University of Athens and also here within EPLO. So much said about Eurocrim, so the European Center of Criminal Justice as one of the organizations which uh, co-host uh, today's conference. Unfortunately, Professor Anna Maria Gettos Kalats, uh, who is heading the Balkan Criminology Group, will not be attending. Uh, she is sick and um, she sends her best regards and wishes uh, for lots of success. But may maybe I can just say that the Balkan Criminology Group is such an in initiative which showcases how research within the Southeastern European uh, region can be promoted. Uh, Balkan Criminology Group is a group that has been brought together and was sponsored uh, initially by Max Planck Society in Germany. So it has received big funding for the first time. And uh, I have been uh, informed that for the last three years, it has uh, received um, uh, funding as well um, by GI Talk. So it's so important to keep in mind that there are such initiatives in our region which are dedicated to 
uh, conducting research and exploring the links between corruption and organized uh, crime. Having said that, I would like to give the word to Eduardo Vetter, uh, who is a good friend and also an expert uh, in transnational organized crime. Eduardo Vetere, an Italian national, headed for a long, long time uh, within the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, the branch of treaty affairs, which means that he was responsible for both treaties that we are discussing today, both the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. In this capacity, Eduardo was also a close colleague uh, of Dimitri Vlasis, who was who headed for a long, long time, as you will just hear, the branch of economic crime and anti-corruption. I don't want to say any more about Dimitri Vlasis because I think that Eduardo, as a close friend and colleague of Dimitri's, is the right person to address today's conference. Eduardo, you have the word. Hello there, yeah. But I think that while we turn our efforts and our attention to protect these more problems, we must also bear in mind that government takes everything without exception. At every level in the modern society uh, and in every country in the world, develop or develop. I think it is possible. I don't know if it's possible within our own lifetimes. Uh, and I do, I do not use consciously the word no education uh, when I speak about God because I believe that what we are doing here is actually. Thank you, Professor. Dear friends and colleagues, you have seen Dimitri. You have heard his words. We may have done a very lousy job, but Dimitri did an exceptionally and outstanding job. As, uh, as a colleague, as uh, an expert and also as a son of Greece, as a son of Athens, to which he was uh, really always very attached. I was the one who hired Dimitri. I recruited him. And since the very beginning, he demonstrates a fantastic capacity to face whatever challenge was placed in front of him. Now, as you have seen, and as uh, many people, my colleagues have already said here, Dimitri is mainly re acknowledged and recognized by the international community as uh, the Mr. Anti-Corruption in the international circle, because he, he was, uh, his presence and his capacity and his abilities 
were uh, uh, recognized as fundamental and as essential for the negotiations of uh, the Convention Against Corruption. It was uh, an ad hoc committee, open-ended, so all member states of the UN negotiating in Vienna, and in two years, the convention was negotiated, three different readings made and adopted, record time, less than two years, by the General Assembly, with a high-level conference held in Merida, where we had a, an unbelievable number of signatures. And for the first time in the United Nations history, the same time in which there was the signature, there was one country, Kenya, which also ratified. So, but I have to say that uh, it's completely wrong to think and to say that it was only the main person behind, because he was the secretary of the uh, ad hoc committee, which made uh, and was able to craft the Convention Against the Corruption. He was also the one who was the secretary of the ad hoc committee negotiating the Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. Also this in record time, convention with three protocols in very important subjects like uh, trafficking of persons, particularly women and girls, like smuggling of migrants, like uh, trafficking of firearms. So uh, 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 I would like to hear to uh, uh, underline the fact that uh, what Dimitri did in uh, a short period of uh, basically four years uh, during the negotiations uh, of these two very important international instruments was something that uh, uh, probably nobody would have been able to do. And while, for example, also I have to say, I was uh, very close working with him as uh, the director of the Treaty Affairs Division for the Anti-Corruption Convention, uh, uh, for the one against transnational organized crime, I was on a peacekeeping mission first uh, in Iraq and after in Western Sahara. So he really had a tremendous task of carrying uh, uh, almost alone this uh, 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 difficult and uh, challenging uh, 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 enterprise, I have to say. Uh, now, a final word about uh, 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 is the words of Dimitri lousy generation, it gives the impression that uh, almost of a defeat. But this is uh, the way in which he has been living, the way in which uh, he has been behaving, the way in which uh, he has always uh, conducted his life, not only vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations office and the United Nations Secretariat and the international community, but also vis-a-vis -vis all his friends. This be his family, and he, I'm glad that there is uh, his adored wife, Lisa, his children, one of his children, the second one, Yannis, the first one, Christos, who is also working now in the United Nations following the example of his father in the anti-corruption branch. We have been friends for an entire life. I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eduardo, for your kind words and moving words, uh, which reflect I believe uh, the feelings of all of us who have met uh, Dimitri Vlasis, uh, who made who had a huge impact on uh, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, but uh, I think his influence went way beyond that. Um, Dimitri fostered friendship uh, with leading anti-corruption experts, 
And uh, it is always friendship and um, a common quest for integrity, for a better world um, that is a driving force um, behind any international instrument if it's going to have the success that UNCAC has had in the last uh, few years. Um, here in Greece, uh, we have the National uh, Anti-Corruption uh, Authority, Ethniki Archi Diafanias. The National Anti-Corruption Authority uh, is an authority that was established a few years ago, and it brought together under one umbrella all anti-corruption authorities that we had scattered in public administration before that time. Um, this new authority, the new anti-corruption authority, uh, has both preventive tasks, but also controlling and investigating uh, authorities uh, in Greece. Uh, it combines, as you can see behind me, um, a promotion of integrity, of transparency and accountability. And the National Anti-Corruption Authority of Greece, of course, implements both the United Nations framework against corruption, but also the European one and the Council of Europe one. Uh, so we have the privilege to have uh, with us uh, today, Mr. Ioannis Fustanakis. He's the director of the Directorate of Strategic Planning and Behavioral Analysis of the National Transparency Authority of Greece. And Mr. Pustanakis will be will give us a lecture about the National Anti-Corruption Strategy 2022-2025 from A to Z. And this includes E, education. So our tasks for education in Greece for the coming years. Mr. Pustanakis, you have the word. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it is a great honor uh, to be here among uh, you. I see a lot of young people and uh, I believe that um, I see also future practitioners uh, and uh, academics or leaders of tomorrow among us. Um, I'm representing the National Transparency Authority of Greece. Uh, we're a newly established authority. Uh, we established in 2019. We brought together, as uh, Professor said, uh, six privilege entities uh, combating corruption uh, and coordinating corruption. For the first time uh, since uh, 2019, um, we designed and we brought, we had the initiative to design and take the ownership of the National Anti Corruption Action uh, Plan uh, for 2022 uh, 2025. Um, thus, uh, meaning that uh, we will be the owners of the actions inside the action plan. We had an extensive uh, consultation. Uh, during the phase of the design uh, of uh, the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan, uh, with uh, both with uh, civil society, uh, both with uh, uh, institutes that are uh, specializing uh, in uh, combating corruption, um, but also with uh, the competent uh, public uh, organizations. The National Anti-Corruption Action Plan is a dynamic policy tool uh, for combating and preventive uh, fraud and corruption in Greece. Uh, it is a, a structured uh, framework um, and uh, it serves as a coordination platform that uh, brings together all uh, major stakeholders, uh, namely public, private and uh, social security. Um, as I previously said, said uh, we had an action plan. We had actually some uh, years ago, uh, since uh, 2012, uh, first, uh, let's say, efforts of Greece uh, to have uh, our uh, National Anti-Corruption Action Plan. Uh, but as, uh, uh, it was uh, mostly an action plan that was following the memorandum and the uh, memoranda and the uh, fiscal policy uh, consolidation that uh, was taking place uh, during that time. Uh, the public organizations that uh, had the um, had to implement the actions, had not actually the ownership. That was the main problem uh, of our 
our organization. Uh, today, uh, we, had, we have uh, uh, the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan for 2022-2025, which with the law 4915 of 2022, it is approved by the Council of Ministers at the highest political level. It is very important for us. It shows the commitment of the government to implement actions against uh, corruption. Um, we have uh, started the implementation uh, uh, and uh, we are very proud. And uh, uh, it is a holistic approach uh, against corruption. It has three pillars. Uh, it has uh, the detection and uh, investigation pillar. It has the preventive pillar. And it has the raising awareness and the educational pillar there. Uh, it is very important uh, not only to take measures just to uh, detect uh, corruption, but also to educate the young people and, uh, uh, and, and trust uh, and um, strengthen the um, uh, trust of uh, citizens uh, in institutions, as, as we say uh, very often. Um, we have actions there that are both uh, targeted internally for our uh, capacity building, for our investigators, our practitioners in the preventive pillar, but we also have uh, um, actions there that uh, are targeted uh, in the society or in the youth or the universities. Um, during uh, the phase, uh, during this phase, uh, we have uh, our uh, annual audit plan, our risk-based audits for uh, our practitioners, uh, forensics uh, seminar seminars. Um, we have also, we are responsible for the internal control system and the integrity advisors, as well as the gift policy and the lobbying policy, which are very important tools in the preventive pillar. And uh, we also have a lot of uh, uh, memorandum and uh, uh, events, activities uh, that raise uh, awareness. Um, most of, of them uh, concerns uh, um, uh, the youth, the primary and the secondary education. Uh, we had there, um, in cooperation with the Ministry of Education, uh, the first uh, um, national competition on student creativity for primary and secondary education on integrity leaders of tomorrow. Uh, it was a very important uh, one, uh, which was completed uh, uh, last year. Two, 217 uh, students uh, from th uh, 37 schools took part. Uh, we had uh, a very important uh, seminars uh, in co collaboration with the uh, UNODC in primary and secondary ed education um, with the Ministry of uh, Education. And uh, we also have uh, had uh, presentations uh, for uh, the third uh, grade junior high school uh, students in 2020-2021, as well as interventions in the curriculum for uh, primary and secondary education. Um, we believe in synergies, we want synergies, we implement synergies in uh, practice, and uh, we are here, uh, as I said uh, before, um, to offer a hand uh, in uh, the fight against uh, corruption. Corruption is a phenomena, phenomenon that uh, will not be eradicated, as I previously uh, heard. Uh, it is among the human nature, let's say, uh, but uh, we must uh, take all uh, necessary action and uh, uh, give the opportunity to young people uh, to live in a better, let's say, uh, society. That's, that's all. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fustanakis, uh, for um, presenting to us um, the anti-corruption strategy of the Hellenic Republic uh, for the next few years. Uh, it's, uh, it's so important that education is an integral part of it. And I think it's uh, very important that we further strengthen uh, this cooperation. Because after all, anti-corruption has to start you know, with society. And it is our youth, it is young people that we, we see among ourselves today that are part of the society, which is the core of our society. So education is 
ethnic corruption starts and fighting organized crime starts with education. This is, it is so important to underline this. And currently, uh, because uh, I thought about it when I heard your presentation, I work uh, with the International Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities. Uh, we have been awarded a bid um, to prepare a guidance, a guide for anti-corruption authorities all around the world for meaningful youth engagement. And we are preparing such a guidance with best practices and models of how to engage youth, of course, through education. One of the main actions is through education for awareness raising. So we, we must, the anti-corruption authority must work closely with universities and other um, um, civil society uh, organizations. Um, let me just say that we, I, I founded back in 2013, Anti-Corruption Youth Greece. And we had the honor uh, to be uh, awarded uh, in 2016 the United Nations uh, Award for uh, Anti-Corruption Excellence in the field of youth engagement. So it's so important that here in Greece, we have capacity, we have know-how, we have expertise, and we should join forces uh, with the National Anti-Corruption Authority and other anti-corruption authorities throughout the region to promote uh, our work. Having said that, there is another very important organization in Southeastern Europe. It is called Regional Anti-Corruption Initiative, RAI, as you see in the program. And the Regional Anti-Corruption Initiative um, is an intergovernmental organization. So it's not just an NGO like Transparency International or Youth Anti-Corruption Youth Greece. So it is an organization like EPLO, which was founded and established and has, as we speak, nine member states. Allow me to mention this. Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Croatia, Moldova, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Romania, and Serbia. So these are the member states of the Regional Anti-Corruption Initiative, which brings together society, educational uh, organizations from this wide region, and of course, Greece is neighboring uh, this region that we just uh, mentioned. Uh, I would like to give the word to Mrs. Desislava Gotskova, who is the head of Secretariat of RAI, to introduce to us the role of the education in enhancing regional cooperation against corruption. You have the word. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I feel extremely very privileged to be here in the heart of uh, democracy to present uh, the work of the Regional Anti-Corruption Initiative. But before I start with my presentation, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting us and for giving us the chance uh, to present our work. I would like to thank the European Public Law Organization and GTOC uh, for the invitation and the uh, Ambassador Lutzvek uh, for all his uh, support as well. Uh, as uh, I have a presentation, oh, okay, so you're gonna assist me. As Mr. Zubas uh, already uh, explained, uh, Re Regional Anti-Corruption Initiative is international intergovernmental organization, which was established almost 20 years ago, back in 2003, under the Stability uh, Pact. In 2007, it has been renamed to the Regional Anti-Corruption Initiative, RAI, and uh, uh, with an MOU signed by the Ministries of Justice of all participating parties. The um, Secretariat Headquarters is, uh, is in Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and currently RAI has nine member states. And, through, and, and three observers, Poland, Georgia, and Slovenia. Uh, Greece is not a member of RAI, not an, uh, or an observer for the time being, I hope. Nevertheless, yesterday we had a very uh, fruitful discussions with the NTA authorities. We are very much impressed by the, uh, their work and achievements, and we hope that we can cooperate with them and probably have Greece part, being part of the, joint, uh, the uh, initiative soon. RAI mission is to enhance regional cooperation in the fight against corruption, support and strengthen the capacity of the countries in their anti-corruption efforts. 
Rai is not an academic institution, nevertheless, we are implementing activities, um, uh, training activities, um, and trying to engage with uh, uh, youth. We do believe that change begins with education, and therefore, Rai anti-corruption education efforts aim at strengthening the knowledge and skills about anti-corruption tools and mechanisms in line with international standards, as well as communicating the role of public integrity as an essential tool to prevent corruption. The target audience of RAI edu anti-corruption education efforts is general public, young people, professional community, mainly institutions involved in anti-corruption, judiciary, uh, CSOs, civil society organizations, and media. Learning outcomes of RAI education efforts include strengthening the ability of targeted audience to identify and promote public integrity values that promote public good over private gain, identify corruption, compare and determine different types of uh, corruption behavior, develop and apply tools and mechanisms to fight corruption, uh, identify organizations to which corruption can be reported, different ways uh, to report corruption, concept of whistleblowing protection, the role of media and civil society uh, organization in fighting corruption. The end goal is to support the is to support the accomplishment of the following objectives. People reject corruption in recognition of the damages it causes, and institutions, media, and civil society are equipped to contribute to the fight against corruption. RAI approaches uh, to anti corruption education include uh, RAI Summer School for Junior Professionals. The conducting and organizing thematic training for public institutions, CSOs and media, public information and education campaigns, and e-learning tools, which is something that is really, uh, uh, we have just started. Rai Summer School for Junior Anti-Corruption Professionals in Southeastern Europe is probably the, um, oldest uh, activity RAI uh, implements. It has been established back in 2005 as an initiative of, at that time, uh, Romanian Ministry of Justice to build and strengthen relationships between civil servants of anti-corruption institutions in Southeastern Europe by sharing good practices and exchange experience. Friendship and networking has been mentioned a couple of times in the morning. And this is something that we try to do alongside with providing um, uh, the um, junior uh, anti-corruption professionals with knowledge. We try to establish good uh, um, uh, and fruitful uh, cooperation. This year was the 17th edition of the RAI Summer School. Uh, uh, and it was held in July in Sofia. So far, more than 460 junior anti-corruption experts have been trained. Previous, uh, the, the themes that have been covered uh, under the Rai Summer Schools are, is, are judicial integrity, financial investigations, asset recovery, whistleblowing, um, money laundering, international judicial cooperation in criminal matters, judicial reform as a prerequisite for uh, uh, effective anti-corruption uh, policies. The approach of the uh, RAI uh, summer school is instructor-led instructor training and uh, interactive case studies. RAI also, alongside with the uh, summer school, RAI also organizes thematic regional and national training, mainly targeting public institutions, but also we try to go beyond public institutions, uh, which are our main uh, beneficiaries, uh, and uh, extend to uh, CSOs and media. And also what we are uh, currently working uh, on is bringing all of them together 
at the, the so-called multi-beneficiary uh, trainings. And um, examples of those include uh, regional webinars on whistleblowing protection, uh, regional training on whistleblower disclosure and protection in, uh, practice. Currently, we are implementing uh, national masterclasses from silence to action, and we are trying to teach uh, the public institutions, CSOs and media, on how to run successful anti-corruption uh, awareness campaigns. So far, uh, the master classes have been conducted in all capitals of Western Balkans jurisdictions. And our last master class would be in November in Chisinau, Moldova. Also, um, we are uh, conducting uh, youth events to promote promote whistleblowing among uh, young leaders. Young leaders have been mentioned as well. We do consider that young people are more, are uh, actually the drivers for change, and therefore we would like to encourage and invest more efforts to make them aware and make them, if possible, be proactive in uh, uh, their uh, uh, anti-corruption uh, behavior. Rai has uh, engaged with the youth by delivering expert TED Talks uh, at their events. We, worked with, we work with the European Youth Parliament. Uh, we simulate parliamentary discussions and the resolutions adoptions. And uh, in uh, all our events so far, we have reached out to more than 300 young leaders throughout the region. We also provide training on different uh, um, thematic trainings like corruption risk assessment and corruption proofing of legislation. Probably, uh, I suppose, and this is what we are really proud of, is uh, our public information and education campaign, which is uh, currently implemented in uh, all Western Balkan jurisdictions and Moldova. The uh, campaign consists of uh, several components. Uh, the first one being the guerrilla campaign. The aim of the guerrilla events was to raise public awareness about the damage caused by corruption and the importance of the contributions of each citizen to the fight against corruption. The guerrilla campaign also aimed to raise awareness about whistleblowing. And I uh, do believe that uh, um, pictures and movies show much more about words. So we have prepared a very uh, short video, which to, just to illustrate and demonstrate what the campaign looks like. Uh, it's going to be weird. Yeah. Seven jurisdictions, seven cities, one mutual social issue. That's why we invited the Sarajevo, Hovkarica, Tirana, Pristina, Skopje, Chisinau, and Belgrade audience to become aware of this burning problem. We showed them how much money is lost to corruption every day. But we gave them the chance to stop it by whistling for the end and putting them in the perspective of the whistleblowers. Every time they push the button, money devolution would stop for one minute and public funds would be saved. More than 137,000 visitors saved more than 8,400,000 euros. Break the silence. This silence for the end. We have, yeah, that, that's it. If we can go, go back to the presentation, we are very proud of uh, the campaign. It received the EPAC award last year for the most innovative uh, uh, campaign in the field of anti corruption. The total reach of this campaign uh, is almost 25 million people in, on C, uh, South, uh, in Southeastern Europe uh, through on site visits, TV TV, radio, print, and online reach. Uh, this is a figure, I know it sounds impressive. It has been, uh, the research has been conducted by our partners. Um, so we do realize that the, the figures is correct. 
Uh, another um, component of the uh, uh, campaign is the social experiment video, uh, Whistle for the Brave, which explores the, diffi the difficult reality of being a whistleblower. And uh, it's available on uh, Rai uh, YouTube channel and on Rai uh, web page. Currently, we are working, and uh, by the end of the year, most probably for the uh, uh, Anti-Corruption Day on 9th of December, we would release uh, human, a couple of human interest stories videos uh, for wi prominent whistleblowing blowers from the region. This is a documentary type of human interest stories, which focus on the emotional journey of, uh, of a whistleblower. And uh, uh, this is an angle which is uh, often uh, neglected, but what we would like to show is uh, very honestly and open uh, the, the human story of the whistleblowers uh, and also the change that they uh, have brought to uh, the, uh, their countries and their communities and society and thus encourage uh, the public uh, to uh, to have a proactive behavior and report cases of corruption. So we'll keep you posted in case you're interested with uh, uh, when uh, these stories are released. We also do a very uh, uh, active social media and intensive social media campaign aimed at educating the general public and uh, especially youth about whistleblowing and their whistleblower rights through visually attractive and brief educational content, which is displayed in social media, Insta Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Very recently, uh, Rai has engaged into uh, e-learning. And actually uh, our uh, uh, e-learning platform has been released a week ago. Um, it uh, provides with the following e-learning opportunities, self-assessment tool for whistleblower protection systems, which enables the organizations to assess whether they fulfill uh, human resource and organizational requirements to enable an effective and efficient response to a whistleblower report. The self-assessment tool is available in all uh, local languages of the region, including uh, uh, English and Romanian languages. It is the first such open source lear learning uh, resource, uh, which provides for this uh, practical guide guide guidance. It's available on RAI webpage. So I would encourage those of you who are interested to visit. We also do uh, really, we also did release the public legal education on whistleblowing uh, um, e-learning uh, system, which provides a comprehensive information on the available whistleblowing uh, channels and whistleblower protection in the Western Balkans. It is also available in all local languages and Romanian, which uh, we suppose would. Um, encourage uh, people who are interested and who, who would like to report uh, to address um, uh, the um, responsible authorities. Also, we have developed an online course on corruption risk assessment, which focuses on the corruption risk management as a preventive mechanism and tool to strengthen a culture of integrity and prevent corruption drawing on both national and international experiences. The course equips professionals with knowledge and helps them to advance the implementation of CRA mechanisms in their daily work. The choice of the e-learning topics has been driven by RAI strategic objectives, but also by the needs identified by RAI members countries. To conclude, the right Secretariat will consider more uh, opportunities uh, for expansion of its online learning hub by including additional topics of interest, and we will continue to invest in anti-corruption education by building partnerships, and we look for opportunities to work together with academia and engage more with a uh, young uh, generation. Here, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, encourage you to visit our webpage if you're interested in uh, either the public awareness campaign or the learning hub. To contact us, 
if you need any assistance or if you are interested in my work. And I'm here for the two days. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer now or during the coffee breaks or uh, throughout the, those two days. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Uh, Gotkova. I think it's quite impressive uh, what you are doing at uh, RAI. And I really liked uh, the guerrilla campaign. Um, so you see what they did. Um, um, they had a pile of money in front of them. This is money spent on corruption, on bribes. And this is money uh, which is uh, actually mismanaged, so badly managed. It doesn't flow into development. It doesn't flow into infrastructure. It is supposed to be for infrastructure development for good causes. But instead of this, you see the, how they destroyed this money. Eh? It, when it goes into pockets, pockets of politicians, pockets of uh, whoever is in a position to manage. Uh, these uh, flows of uh, money. And whenever uh, a civilian uh, went by and pushed that button by reporting corruption, so these are the whistleblowers, the ones who report incidents of corruption to authorities, um, this procedure stopped. So this saved the public money. And I think this was very illustrative how you did it. And this is a good idea uh, and a nice example, I would say, uh, because we must work, when we work with youth and when we work with civil society and when we try to educate, we must use pictures as well, uh, not just words. Uh, these exemplify what we're trying to say much better than just words. So, so this is a very nice best practice and also, and also that uh, learning hub that you are developing. And I think it would be useful, not just for your member states, but for other uh, players and stakeholders in the region to make use of those resources that have been uh, developed uh, by RAI. So thank you very much uh, for your very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, now we will go into a coffee break. Um, for participants uh, coming from abroad and panelists, uh, we do host a coffee break, which is here at EPLO. Our students and anyone else attending, you have half an hour of coffee break and we will resume so you can you know, take a walk around here. It's a very nice uh, place. But we will resume our works at 11.30 for a presentation by Mr. Agelos Binis, who was the former governor of the National Anti-Corruption Authority as is currently head of internal audit for Frontex. So Frontex, you know, is the European policing authority for our borders and does so much work with migrant smuggling and trafficking and so on. So we will hear by Mr. Binis after the coffee break uh, about uh, their um, efforts uh, in international cooperation uh, for anti-corruption and for anti-organized crime. So I will. we will see you all in half an hour. Thank you very much.
Ναι, καλησπέρα με ακούτε. Καλησπέρα. Ναι, καλησπέρα.
Yes, we can try it. Kalimera. Kalimera. Ako kung makala. Yes, yes, yes. The camera is okay, and let's see if I can also share my screen. Yes, you can. So it's fine. It's and it, it's in full screen. Uh, you need to share the. You need to do share. It's okay now. It's full screen. And the changing is okay. Yes, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, perfect. Many thanks. You're welcome. Hello, Mr. Benis Hi. Angelos. Can you see me? Yes. Hello. Good morning. Hi, Costa Palikarski here. It's been some time. I, it's a little bit blurry, and I didn't. I just I just wanted to say hi because when we when when you do the actual presentation there will be no time. Um, very happy to see you, even though only online. Same here. So your name and the agenda, but I didn't know if you were going to be present this morning. I mean Athens. So uh, in case if you're here, we could we could meet, but I suppose you're not. So uh, well, good luck in your new position. Unfortunately, I'm in Warsaw, but. I hope we we'll find an opportunity to have a coffee or lunch, dinner. All the best, Costa. Nice to see you again. Uh, so we're good. So we're waiting for um, 11.30, okay? Okay, okay. Thank you.
So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me have your attention, please. Uh, we resume our works. Um, we heard earlier today uh, by Mr. Fustanakis about the Greek national anti-corruption strategy for the years 2022-2025 uh, in general and also with regard to educational uh, activities uh, in the field of anti-corruption. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Angelos Binis, um, former governor of the National uh, Anti-Corruption Authority and currently um, head of interna internal audit capability of Frontex. Um, I think we all know that Frontex uh, is the European uh, task force and um, uh, policing uh, authority uh, for our um, European borders uh, with a very strong focus on um, fighting organized crime uh, in the forms of uh, migrant smuggling, uh, trafficking in human beings, uh, and in every uh, international uh, organization, um, we need an internal audit department uh, to control and to prevent um, corruption. Uh, because corruption happens uh, with law enforcement uh, agencies, both nationally, regionally, and internationally. Um, so I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Binis, um, who uh, I believe sits in Warsaw uh, as we speak, uh, and will um, present uh, for us uh, online. Uh, Mr. Binis, welcome, and you have the word. Thank you very much, Professor Zubius and the APLO for the invitation. Good morning to everybody from Warsaw. Uh, it's a very good opportunity to talk a little bit about what is being done at the European Union's level, uh, and uh, more specifically in the EU agencies, on uh, curbing fraud and putting in place effective controls to prevent and to respond to fraud. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see some slides on how Frontex is working with anti-corruption, especially focusing on the prevention side, which is the main role of the internal audit function across private sector organizations. So we're focusing very much, as Professor you has said, since this is a law enforcement agency and standing corps staff do carry firearms with a very pivotal role in uh, countering uh, migrant smuggling, terrorism, uh, drugs trafficking, on how we would raise the awareness of fraud among our staff. So what is the relationship between governance and anti-fraud? A very specific focus on conflict of interest policy, the Frontex anti-fraud strategy, and the fourth item is how do we enhance facilitate reporting on wrongdoings and irregularities, the, uh, as we uh, know, the whistleblowing channels. So this is the organizational chart of Frontex. Frontex is the biggest EU agency with 700 million budget, and uh, its total staff will reach 10,000 people by 2027. The internal capability on your left is an independent function, providing assurance on the management board and the executive director that all risks are mitigated to the level of being accepted to executive management. So wh why does ethics matter for Frontex and the EU agencies? First, public accountability, citizen trust. Second, there is a high level of scrutiny from NGOs, from the European Parliament, from the Ombudsman, European Ombudsman, the citizens. Third, ethics are and should always be at the core of good and accountable governance. These are the principles of work behavior, which can be found in the staff regulations of officials of the European Union, as well as the conditions of employment of the servants of the European Union. There are six principles that we're going to see uh, very briefly. This is a slide talking about the relation between ethics, which is more of a moral set of moral principles, and then what is integrity, which is actually ethics 
in action. These are the ethical principles for all staff working at the EU level. First, independence, then second, impartiality, third, objectivity, fourth, loyalty, fifth, circumspection, sixth, responsibility, seventh, transparency, and eighth, accountability. These are the core principles that should be the foundation, but also the guidance for all operations of EU staff. A uh, few slides on conflict of interest policy, which is a very crucial issue when we're talking about preventing corruption. There are six different set of rules in, within Frontex on how we deal with conflict of interest policy, addressing different categories of staff, including management board members, executive management, standing corps, the uniform staff, and also a very detailed guidance, a circular on the prevention of conflict of interest issued in 2018. Scope, persons concerned, what is the obligation to abstain, and the most important thing here you should remember, the declaration of a potential conflict of interest does not imply that this conflict of interest really exists and will influence uh, the behavior of the Frontex staff. This is what we do, not to stay only with the theoretical aspects, but real case scenarios. For example, conflict of interest arising in the context of the tenders evaluation committee, or the selection committee when we're talking about recruiting staff. A similar scenario, like a member of the selection committee is the godfather of one candidate's child. The child is now 10 years old, does not see his godfather more than once every two years. What is the proper course of action for this election committee member? Should he see abstain from the selection process and be substituted for this specific candidate? Third one, negotiation on the contract. And then very briefly, the different strategy in Frontex. It was voted in November 2021. It covers three years, 22, 23, and 24. It is needed not only because it's a legal requirement, but also because it's a core foundation of what we call governance, risk, and control arrangement. The main purpose is to increase awareness among staff and external stakeholders in Frontex activities. It has three very specific objectives. As you can see, the third one is to strengthen the whistleblower culture and facilitate whistleblowing within Frontex. There is a very clear set of allocating roles with managers on what they have to do, whether it's the legal and procurement unit, the budget and finance, human resources, and of course there are roles and tasks for all staff members, as well as external partners, suppliers, contractors, and consultants. They should all comply with a different strategy. This is how we approach uh, in this uh, course to talk about what are the core components of the fraud as a fraud case. So there is the motivation, the pressure, which is individual to any one of us. Then there is the opportunity, the gaps in the internal control system, and the rationalization. Everybody does it, why not me? I'm very much I'm qualified and I don't get the remuneration that should based on my qualification. We do use a set of red flags, which are the signals, the indicators of potential fraud. And again, case studies, practical examples, whether we're talking about abuse of allowances, accepting gifts from contractors, influencing the recruitment procedures, artificially maintaining a contract with the company where there is no need to continue this contract. And from these scenarios and investigations, we produce red flags in specific areas like procurement, contract management, need identification, human resources, and grants. It's very important to say that everybody has a role, management to set the tone, all staff is responsible to have a role to play within the defraud strategy of Frontex. Two slides of whistleblowing, very important tool to prevent corruption. These are the principles within the Frontex whistleblowing policy. Key definitions, the conditions 
for effective whistle blowing in writing without delay. It should concern serious irregularities. What is, what is not whistle blowing, personal issues, personal disagreements, or um, complaints in bad faith because I didn't get a promotion I was looking for. And we also draw lessons and work closely with Olaf, whether we're talking about recruitment or travel allowances or medical expenses, any fraud scenario that has been identified at cross agency level. So these were the key points on my side concerning the, the front and the front strategy and three things, since I know there are a lot of students among the audience. First, continue and seek opportunities to work on a decorruption and audit. Second, seek opportunities and work hard on finding work and working in EU agencies, international organization. One of the best examples that we had is the late Dimitris Vlasis, who held a very high position at the UN. And third, strive for professional certifications, not only academic uh, qualifications, but also professional certifications like Certified for the examiner, certified internal auditor, all of this could help you work and get very good positions and places in the uh, either private or public sector. Many thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I will give my uh, personal email. You can get it if somebody wants to make a follow up question. Thank you, Professor Zubas. Thank you, Mr. Bini, so much for this uh, very insightful presentation. Uh, I must say, I was really impressed by the numbers that you shared with us. I didn't know, I, we all know, I mean, we hear it in the news about the work, the great work that Frontex is doing, but I had no idea that you currently employ 10,000 staff and that you have a budget of 700 million euros. So we're talking about a really big organization. And we just heard about the challenges in terms of employment, procurement, and so on that such an organization faces and how you tackle and prevent any kind of uh, abuse. Uh, may it be corruption, uh, conflict of interests, uh, and so on. And about the whistleblower mechanisms uh, that are set uh, within uh, Frontex. And of course, Frontex is very lucky to have you with a very uh, long and vast experience that you have in the field of compliance and anti-corruption. Uh, Mr. Binis uh, pointed out that the floor is open as well for questions and remarks. So if anyone wants to take the floor, ask a question or make a remark, please indicate it to me and I will be very happy to share uh, the floor uh, with you. Um, if there is no question, I would like um, to thank Mr. Binis uh, warmly for being with us um, today um, for this uh, conference. Uh, and uh, I would like to move on um, to our next uh, panelists. Um, the next panel discussion um, is about the Global Initiatives Organized Crime Index. So GI Talk. Um, has done a few years ago something similar to what we know uh, as the Corruption Perception Index, CPI Index uh, of um, Transparency International. And um, GI Talk um, conducts uh, research uh, for a global organized crime index. Um, the main features and key findings for our region, for the Southeast European region, uh, will be presented to us uh, by Dr. John Collins, Director of Academic Engagement, and Ambassador Ugi Svekic, uh, Senior Advisor of uh, GI Talk. So, Dr. Collins, you have the floor. All the best on my side. Many thanks for the opportunity. And uh, have a nice conference. Looking forward to reading to the minutes of this one. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Binis. Have a good day. Great. Thank you. So, uh, Yanis, are, are the slides going to appear miraculously behind me? Yes. Okay. I'll wait for that. Maybe not. <laughs> Does the clicker work as well? Does the... 
Uh, okay, perfect. So I can ask you to, to move to the next slide if that's okay. Uh, no, that's... Yanis, are they there? Ah, right. Does this work? He does. Yanis is just, I think Yanis is loading it up. Give us a second until we get uh, John's presentation, please. Um, it is important, let me bridge the gap by saying um, indexes are very important. Uh, they are very important because they measure performance of a state like Greece in a certain field. So the corruption perception index measures perceptions, so people's beliefs about corruption. So citizens are being asked, how corrupt are Greek officials? Were you ever involved in an act of corruption? Have you ever been asked for money when trying to get a driver's license or a building authority license and so on? So this is the research done in order to compile an index. Mm -hmm. And it's very important because indexes are done worldwide and we have a comparison of regions and states and nations and we can see who is doing well and who is doing bad. And we can check this year after year and see if we performed better than last year. Uh, so it is very important if we're trying, it, it is very important as well, uh, I'm, I'm saying this in advance, uh, John, to see how the ratings received for a specific country um, through your um, GI talk organized crime index compare, for example, with the CPI index for a certain country. And if these are parallel findings, for example, if Sweden is doing so well uh, in anti-corruption efforts uh, and the levels of corruption mm -hmm. in Sweden are so low, how does this country do? Uh, in terms of uh, organized uh, crime as well. So this is a, this is a, these are very interesting findings. And uh, you now that we have your presentation, you have the word for this very innovative tool. So please, John. Yeah, perfect. And I think, no, I, I think what Dimitrios is saying is, uh, is very poignant for the index is that it's an iterative process. Um, in itself, when we were generating the first round of the index, that was an iterative process. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But also it's exactly that building on the work that others have done before, right? The methodologies that other indexes use around the world and particularly indexes related to organized crime uh, or corruption. Um, so to say this is the first global organized crime index. Now there have been, uh, I think, things which have come close in the past, but nothing which has covered all 193 UN member states. So that's our real innovation here. It, as I'm going to outline a, a number of points about it, it's not perfect but we think it's pretty damn good and we're, we're, we're very proud of it. Um, so firstly, I'm going to outline the purpose of the index. I'm going to outline some of the main components. Uh, I'm going to outline the scoring methodology. Uh, I'm going to give some words on its development. And then I'm going to hand over to Ugi, who will speak much more specifically about the region and obviously has a lot greater expertise in the region. So just to go through some of the points and the purpose. Um, exactly, as, as again, I think Dimitrios was saying, um, we did not envision this as a, a means to point fingers or to criticize member states specifically. This is about having a constructive dialogue with member states. Um, it's a providing a tool that governments, civil society, uh, other experts can use. And then that forms the baseline for discussion. So again, it is not about criticizing. It is not about pointing fingers. We have been very assiduous to try to be as fair as possible to governments and to others uh, to, to input into the process where possible. Um, we did not enable uh, sitting officials to give input into the process officially because we thought that would potentially skew the findings. So we relied entirely on independent experts, but we have tried to be as fair as possible. 
one of the aims is that we view this as enabling uh, a, a tool to, to enable uh, guiding policymaking and prioritization. You can think of this almost as flying blind. There are parts of the world where you have very advanced, uh, very nuanced discussions on organized crime, corruption, things like that, and huge parts of the world where it's pretty much completely absent. And so this tool was supposed to be a leveler for that, where you could actually have something that policymakers and, and experts could use uh, to, to guide their discussions. Um, we want to understand causality and interrelationships. And I think this is a really important point. Um, given the clandestine nature of organized crime, uh, the, the ability to actually look but beyond simple numbers and try to understand the political economy of, of organized crime in specific contexts and really try to, to develop a more nuanced understanding of that. And that's something GI has from the outset really focused on. And Ogi would, would certainly know this, this, this emphasis on political economy as a, as a way to us understand illicit markets. And then again, as Dimitrios was saying, uh, 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 measuring results, that you have a tool that can from year to year, you can see how some situations change and how country scoring changes over time. And hopefully that is not as a result of a change in methodology within the index, but actually that it's the result of changes that are occurring on the ground. Um, we are obviously in favor of the promotion of evidence-based research wherever possible, but also this idea of predicting trends. And uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the Oscar Wilde quote, I believe it was, you know, I, I, I hesitated predicting anything, especially the future. But I think having a tool where potentially we have an ability to uh, make a, uh, to to get on the front end of the curve with regards to organized crime and co corruption and potentially be able to predict trends. What's going to happen in drug markets in Latin America? What's going to happen in uh, uh, corruption trends within within Africa and so on? So what is the organized crime index? Um, effectively, it breaks down into three components. So I'm going to give you the general overview now. And then I'm going to give you the specifics soon. So I think this works. Yep. If you look at the top end, we disaggregate into a number of components. So if you look at the top end, firstly, we disaggregate by criminal actors. Not all criminal actors are the same. Some are state embedded. Some have no relation to the state, et cetera. Some are international criminal actors. So we divide, divide that into four different groups and we score them accordingly. Then we divide it into 10 individual criminal markets. Now, in the next iteration of the index, we're actually going to do 14. We're adding four new criminal markets. But for this round, we, we, we use 10. And again, I'll, I'll give you an indication of them soon. So if we think of that side as our overview of criminality, the criminal forces within the country, within the political economy, and then this side is what we call resilience. This is maybe not the antidote, can be an antidote, but this is the, the, the shock absorber, or this is the buffer of the, of, against um, criminality. So we then rate that on 12 different metrics. What are the levels of resilience, resilience within the country to withstand organized crime or to push back against organized crime? So this is how they break down. Well, firstly, let's look at the scoring. We score based on one to 10, right? So we then group together criminal actors um, and criminality into one scoring on overall criminality. So one is obviously the least. If you have a score of one on criminality, you have extremely low criminality in the country. I don't think anyone has that. But uh, and if and if you have ten, uh, if you have ten, you have extremely severe influence, right? So that this criminality, criminal groups, criminal actors permeate all levels of society are have a very significant have a very significant impact. And then if you look at resilience, it's the opposite, right? Uh, one is an extremely low level of resilience within the country. You have little ability to push back against organized crime. And 10 is uh, you have highly effective uh, uh, resilience. So this gives you a sense then on how we break them down. So if you look uh, on the right criminal markets, we have, uh, let me just pull it up so I can actually see it, uh, flora and fauna markets. We have human trafficking, arms smuggling. We break drug markets into four different distinct groups. So we look at heroin, cocaine, cannabis, synthetics. Uh, I'm a drug policy person by background. This is what I've worked on most of my uh, academic life. That is very important. These drug markets are very, very different, and they operate very different in different contexts. So that's why we, why we have chosen to do that. And then criminal actors, you can see mafia-style groups. Uh, criminal networks, state embedded actors, and then also foreign actors. So, so obviously the point about uh, disaggregating these are really key. And then we score them on each individual point, 
right? And you can see the, ter the resilience scores that we use as well, territorial integrity, prevention. And what we ask the experts when we're doing this is, uh, firstly, to what extent does that exist, right? Well, to what extent have you got territorial integrity? In a European context, it's very high. In other parts of the world, it obviously can be very low. And then you ask them to score it uh, ba based on that. Okay, so to talk a little bit about the index development, um, it was a huge, huge process. Um, uh, you can see the iterative process underway there. So it begins with um, a literature, an open source research process that creates individual pro profiles of all 193 countries. That in itself is a huge process, right? So you can see that we use 4,000 plus uh, sources, uh, five and a half thousand hours of initial research, right? So a really, really monumentally large process. Um, and then it goes through a, a, another round of data collection. So we actually go and we try to collect data about what's happening in individual countries. And then it goes through what we call the rounds of scoring. And scoring is effectively where you pull together experts and say, okay, on a scale of one to 10, um, what do you think the level of flora and fauna crimes is within, let's say, Ireland? Uh, and I was part of this discussion. And it feels at the time a little bit impressionistic, but when you do it across multiple experts and you have this uh, repeat iterative process, actually it becomes very refined. And you see that actually it ends up being where you expect it to be. Okay, you might have a case where you'd say, okay, the cocaine market in Ireland is not as significant as the UK. So that's probably scored a little bit high. So we'd go back to the drawing board and we'd, and we'd readjust based on that. But so then after the uh, the scoring, we then do an additional regional expert group where you pull across, uh, pull together people across the region, and you discuss the scores, and again do a process to 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 calibrate them, and then after we've done that, uh, we do uh, a, a, an internal calibration with all our observatories. So our observatories in the region do a final check and say yes, we think this is more or less right. So that's that's the very lengthy process that it goes through. It takes a very long time. We had twenty four. Uh, regional and international meetings. We had 350 plus experts involved in the process. So, so a very, very, very long and in intricate pros process. So now I'm going to hand over to Ugi, who's going to, I think, talk much more about the main findings. Can I, oh, I have to use this. Uh, so yes, main findings. It is of course very difficult to present uh, main findings. There are main findings on the global level. There are main findings on the various uh, regions. So we opted here to, to present some main findings on the um, uh, Southeastern European region because that's what we are doing. But before that, just to understand this vulnerability classification as we call it. And one of the main findings of these indexes is actually that nearly 80% of the world's population live in conditions where criminality is pervasive and resilience is not sufficient. And we use these vulnerability metrics actually to illustrate this, right? So the X axis, right, represents criminality and the Y is resilience forming four quadrants and they have now they have different colors just so you can understand uh, better so starting from the lower left quadrant we have the low criminality and low resilience you know that's that's one possibility right next to it in red right on this um, is the high criminality and low resi resilience quadrant where countries in the most dire situation actually fall in. And unfortunately, you will see that some of our countries <laughs> fall, into, <laughs> fall into that quadrant <laughs> with no problems, right? This is, a, um, uh, but overall, almost 80%, right, of the global population live in countries with low resilience hmm, to the organized crime, at least, uh, criminality. On the left top, you have the green quadrant, right? And this is actually the situation in which countries would actually like to be, right? Low criminality and high resilience, right? Um, and then on the top right, we have high criminality and high resilience category. It's a small number of countries, but some of our neighbors, Italy, for example, falls into that 
quadrant, right? So that's very interesting. These quadrant together with the red one on the bottom makes up total again 80%, right? Of the global population who live in high criminality environments. So we have 80% of population that lives with high criminality and 80% with low resilience. Okay, this is, if you like, illustratively, the main global finding of this uh, um, index. Uh, and of course, you know, the regions have, you know, specific things, they are not all the same. So if we look at these, this is what we call criminality resilience nexus. So this is this relationship between crime and response to crime. Resilience is actually response to uh, crime. And the graph here is just one uh, a chunk of the global uh, uh, graph. And that is the bottom is the low resilience qu quadrants. And as you, I mean, you cannot see because it's very small, even I can't see it. But we know that um, Croatia, for example, Greece, Bulgaria, North Macedonia, Kosovo, in the top tri are located just on the edge between the two quadrants. Uh, that only goes to show how vulnerable actually the four countries are to moving into the high criminality square on the right, where you have Serbia, Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Montenegro already, right? So where are these countries going to move to the right or the left? Right? No, we don't know, but this is what we are supposed to predict on the basis of <laughs> index, right? <laughs> this is what it should uh, tell me. So this is the situation uh, in short, of course, about uh, uh, this nexus of criminality and uh, resilience in our region. Of course, I, mean, I cannot go through all the countries, but these are just some, some examples. John has talked about criminal actors. Uh, this uh, uh, paradigmatic presentation of criminal actors is limited and can be from a number of points of view criticized. But this was chosen for this uh, exercise. And so, as you can see, we have actually four uh, mafia style groups, uh, criminal networks, state embedded actors and foreign actors. Uh, and this is actually telling us who is uh, committing or, or carrying out criminal, you know, criminal organized organized crime activities, right? So that is the main. Uh, so we can um, say that generally speaking, although criminal networks can generally be taught as the conduit of illicit flows within a country, in fact, what we found out. Globally speaking, but particularly in this region, and I'll come back to that, and those that have worked with me know it very well, we have the state embedded actors. Yeah? And this is very, very, very characteristic, unfortunately, of our region, and I think that's a bad trademark of our region. And that is uh, really selling us that there is this mixture of um, organized crime and various institutional and business links, right? And this is something that in, in Balkan countries, Southeastern European countries, they have, they tend to cluster to the higher end of state embedded actors. Their state embedded actors are the main actors in these markets, which is very, very import, important. So uh, they are the most prominent actors with a score of 6.7, right? While the average is 5.5. So again, you know, we are a little bit. And, and, and in connection with that, allow me just to say that in our uh, research to link it more to the corruption that Global Initiative carried out in, in this region, we came up with a concept which is called organized corruption. That concept of organized corruption is actually trying to illustrate this linkage of state embedded actors. And this um, organized corruption uh, means involvement or use of, orga uh, of an organized interest entity. And it can be criminal or not. Right? That is why we have state embodied actors through various forms of corruption and related illicit deeds 
from the position of power, right? Or with political coverage to gain financial, political, or social benefits. So this is the definition or description, if you like better, of organized corruption, which fits into this research on organized crime, right? But it is linking us to the research of corruption, right? And there are clearly, through the profile of actor, actors already links. We have carried out a statistical correlation between uh, organized crime index and CPI index. But, and, and it's very high. But of course, you know, all indices, when you associate them statistically, they are very high, highly correlated. So that's nothing new. But they are anyhow very highly correlated. But the concept of state embedded actors and organized corruption actually shows these qualitative, and that's what I want to point out, qualitative linkage between uh, the two. Uh, resilience breakdown is also very much interesting. I can't spend too much time on that, but you see resilience has these 12 uh, clusters. And actually there are some which are government clusters, and that is international cooperation, national laws, law enforcement activities, et cetera, et cetera. And countries, particularly in international cooperation, tend to raise high, but why? For a single fact that one of the indicators of international cooperation was whether the countries ratified UNTOC, and they all have almost, right? <laughs> so, I mean, this is a very, you know, it's a good measure, but it's not sufficient because the real measure of international cooperation for which we do not have data is what Eduardo was referring to in the, the conference of state parties now that is today is finishing in vienna of untok is the number of mutual assistance requests and replies including extradition including asset recovery right and we don't have data on that this is the problem we countries the review mechanism of UNTOC just started, so we hope that this day there are some countries, for example, US, that track down their involvement in international cooperation and make it public. And that's very good. And they are using it quite a lot. So, and then the, the other parts of this in, in resilience breakdown uh, also regard us very much. And that is the involvement of civil society protection of victims, whistleblowers, the DESI has been uh, uh, talking about. And there, the whole world, but Southeast Europe ranks very badly. There is just not sufficient protection of whistleblowers, victims, or even involvement of civil society in these things. And this is so, resilience breakdown, resilience, Factor is skewed towards normative engagement of countries, but not de facto, and relatively absent absence of civil society impact and protection of very important instruments such as whistleblowers, uh, uh, witnesses, and victims. Right? So this is something that uh, I think uh, is uh, uh, important to. Uh, keep uh, uh, in mind. And of course, you know, we have also this uh, relationship between state embedded actors and uh, resilience that in many cases, it is meant that the apparatus that is supposed to be a driving force against organized crime in some way or another influences it negatively. Right, and this is this is what worries us, and so this naturally reflects countries' resilience to the threat. Right, because if you have state institutions that are somehow connected with organized crime, the level of resilience goes down. This is also connected with corruption, and we know that, right? Law enforcement, uh, 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 customs, right judiciary, unfortunately. So there are all these indicators. If you look at organized crime index that is indicating indirectly links with corruption. That, that also tells us why this is what we are talking today. That is teaching organized crime and corruption should go together. They cannot be 
so much separated as they were uh, traditionally uh, speaking. So uh, uh, I can say uh, feedback is that both John and myself and some of our colleagues were involved in the past with some universities in which we have made this presentation of organized crime index to uh, show how it can be used in academic purposes, right? Because you can illustrate it, you can discuss with students where your country is or region, you know, what, what are specificities uh, of that. Also for policy making and media uh, coverage, we, these, uh, we have regular index block uh, series, podcast series, uh, engagement, etc., etc. And as uh, John pointed out, we are developing a new index, which will have four more um, criminal markets and, uh, uh, and some additional criminal actor types. And also we have to a little bit more uh, 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 define better state embedded actors and foreign actors. Right, because how do you really differentiate the presence of foreign actors among uh, those? So I think you know that uh, this is all that I wanted to say. And if you allow me, Mr. Chairman, um, I know from private reliable sources that one of our uh, participants here has carried out uh, an evaluation and analysis of organized crime index in her country. So if you allow me, I would ask Sunchana to tell us a little bit about uh, Croatia and your evaluation. Maybe Sunchana, you can come here so that people can. Uh... Sunchana, come here. So you will hear from the first hand immediate use of <laughs> organized crime index. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Uki. Um, I have to say that I participated twice, actually, once when the index for Croatia was already done and I needed, among other experts, to check what do I think about the results. And I didn't participate in creating the ranking of Croatia. And that was very interesting to read some of uh, conclusions made for different categories. But I have to say at the end uh, that really... I would place Croatia exactly the place that it's that it is on the index, although although in certain level we can debate and this is great for education. But you stated whether the index got right particular criminal market, but overall, overall I would say that placing the country on the right spot it's really something that it should be used by the governments to maybe evaluate the resilience and the criminal markets. And it's, it, it is interesting while you have to um, uh, think about your own country and be critical enough uh, to actually assess based on your knowledge where you think the biggest problems in Croatia are and uh, what what uh, in your own countries. And what uh, you were saying, Ugi, um, I will present it tomorrow. I think it's a valuable tool to connect, for instance, la last uh, Eurobarometer, but I will talk about it tomorrow on corruption for EU member states with, um, uh, with the index, because it's really important to see whether it fits or not uh, 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 to the perception of corruption. But this year, I was in the opposite role. I gave, I was among many, I don't know how many, but that's good. I mean, there, there, there are several at least experts who gave initial assessment. And now I was quite being aware what I had maybe objected last time. I was really uh, thinking what score initially should I give to certain markets? And it's 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 well very well prepared because you compare where Croatia was before, I mean, with other with, with other indexes, and then you have to really think where you will place your own country. Um, and I like a lot new categories because avoiding the assessment of foreign involvement and foreign um, um, uh, companies in the country and foreign criminal groups is something that uh, uh, I think it's great addition to the newest uh, to the newest. Index. That's it. Uh, I yes, please, Eduardo. I would like to make 
Can you you can take the can take it from there, please? First of all, uh, when uh, uh, um, let's say ACA was uh, established and we were together from the very beginning, the exercise was foreseen contemporary for the two instruments. So uh, 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 the fact that uh, later on developed uh, in a different way, mainly for corruption, because we managed to get funds for corruption, uh, we, sorry, the UNODC, I had already, I, I, I was retired already. UNODC managed to get funds for corruption and not for organized crime. This is why, in a sense, that was more developed for corruption rather than for organized crime. One. Two, the important point, and this is the demonstration of what you were talking about, of making the evaluation at different times, is, uh, is, is, is exactly this kind of trend analysis. Because a, from the trend of what uh, is going to happen, using more or less the same type of measurement with possible additions in order to make it more uh, 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 evidential in a sense and uh, ba on, based on research results, uh, you can really see that not only the developments, but you will be able also to make some kind of forecast. I would like to speak of forecast more than predictions, uh, uh, but no doubt looking at the trends, I think that this possible forecast is possible to be made. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, Mr. Pavan Sinha from the International Anti Corruption Academy. Yeah, uh, just a few remarks. Uh, a great work which has been done, and I think uh, it will be more honest on my part if I go through very comprehensively and then remake a remark. But the first impression uh, one is to know about how you chose the experts and how they reacted based on what kind of evidences. This is one part. Uh, second is just to be learning from the CPI index. Don't change the criteria of index too often. Otherwise the indexes become non-comparable. So first round is, is perfect. It's perfect. So, so much of work done. Second round is still okay, but don't change again because then over a period of time, this index will become non-comparable what we are facing with CPI. So this is just, just a suggestion. Uh, it's in the second attempt, I think we should do the best and then keep it for at least for five to 10 years. That's it for my favorite. And the final suggestion is that I need to show is that the if the evaluation of the experts can also be complemented and supplemented with some kind of uh, factual data on what's happening in the countries. For some countries, you may not find this data, but from other countries, yes. Both from the point of view of uh, market and actors, as well as for resilience. Yeah, I can start on that. So, um, as I said, there, there was only a few groups that were disqualified, and that was effectively sitting government officials. We didn't want uh, people who had potential conflicts of interest to be informing the early early stages of the process. But other than that, it, it, it many of them are drawn from what is the G, called the GI network. So we've got a network of about 620 uh, experts all over the world who, who form the core of our organization. So those were our first port of call. And it would be based on on their expertise. So we would have somebody if, uh, to take the Brazilian example, which I'm quite familiar with. Uh, we would have a group of academics in Brazil. We would have uh, people with a great policy expertise who might not be ac academics exactly. Um, and so we would draw on them as our first round. Um, and then also because they would be commenting on the first process of research. So we would have a team of perhaps junior researchers pulling together the initial narrative on the country. And then you would have these much more established experts reviewing that and giving feedback. Some of it was very critical. Some of it was at times brutal, but that's that's how these processes evolve. And I think it was it was always quite useful. Um, and, and, and as was said, it was that 
Um, but there was a lot of back and forth on individual markets within countries. But we generally, in most cases, got to a point where that seems about right. That's that's sort of where, you know, it, there's, there's, there's always an impressionistic element. But I think on the point of um, on, on data collection, so as part of the second phase, we have included some element of that, that we've commissioned papers uh, and research in specific countries to use as part of the index. So the index has highlighted this about the arms market in Mexico. So let's commission a paper and look, actually, let's collect some data on that and, and, and use that as part of it. So, um, yeah. And, and finally, on the point of uh, comparability, uh, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think there's, I don't think we have any major push internally to do any methodological shifts. I think more it's about expanding the coverage. That's, that's where we're going in the second phase and probably we have learned some lessons from the process in the first phase, but I don't think the methodology will shift too much because exactly that we want to make it comparable. And if we can get 10 years of research funding to continue it over 10 years, I think we'll be, we'll be very happy to do that as well. I just to add, and I know we should finish this because Costa is waiting here for very important things uh, uh, to say that as I was involved in several of these phases and it's important to appreciate that expert, uh, expert appreciation of this course, for example, for our region, was done in the regional context. Uh, so it was not, you know, that we were only looking at one country, right? But we looked at other countries in the neighborhood and how they score, because there is a lot of these, it's not, yeah, transnational, transregional, activities. So if you know, if you look at Albania, it's not that you cannot look at Serbia or North Macedonia or Montenegro. You have to look, you know, where they score. They are really related. Some score a little bit more or less, but that's why they are all clustered same. So there is a, I think the regional context is inbuilt into these sort of uh, expert appreciation or if you like evaluation of the scores. But, no, no, but I think that we have finished these. Yes, please. No, I am not sharing. So you can do it. So give me half an hour for remarks because this is. Uh, no, but this is this is this is. We have five minutes. Um, this is so interesting, and I think for the public as well attending. Uh, and this is the Global Organized Crime Index. So in a few words, what does this show us? It's a, we have a red mark, so it's criminality index and resilience index, so response to crime, the blue one. And if you are high in red, it means that you have a lot of criminality in your country. And if you are high in blue, it means that you respond well to crime in your country. So let's just mention, because Ugi, Ugi did mention, um, our region is very red. So we have a lot of criminality. And our region is not that blue. So we don't respond that well to organized crime. And I was just looking at how Greece scored and how Greece ranks eh, in, in the latest uh, um, index. And I think this is it is quite interesting to see um, that in terms of criminality score, Greece, so organized crime score, we are ranked 90 second out of 193 UN countries. So 92, one being the worst, 193 being one being the best. So we're 92, eh? so over the half. So closest to the worst. 14th out of 44 countries in Europe. I guess this is Council of Europe. So this is a whole region that you refer to. So pretty bad, pretty bad and even worse, in, in terms of Southern Europe, we are third out of eight. So one being the worst, and we are number three in Southern Europe. And if I have a look at the regional indexes, if I have a look at the regional indexes of Europe in terms of uh, criminality, allow me to say Central and Eastern Europe, so Balkans, are higher in red, so more criminality than Southern Europe, because there you have, of course, Portugal, Italy, and so on. So the average score of criminality is 5.2 Eastern Europe, 4.4 Southern Europe, so less criminality. And although we're part of Southern Europe, we are scoring 5.7. 
we are scoring 5.7. So more than 4.4 for Southern Europe, more than 5.2, the average score for Eastern Europe, the Balkans, and we score as Greece 5.7. Of course, like every perception index, uh, there is you know, relative value to what we discuss here, but still there is value in this because it is a measurement. And as you just heard, we have criminal markets. So if you add more criminal markets, and I take on, on your um, on your comment uh, about how you can compare one index with another, and you know your rankings year after year. If you mix more criminal markets in this, then someone who is very high, let's say, in drugs, but low in cybercrime, next year, if you are high in cybercrime but low in drugs. This will change your ranking, of course, in your index. So this must be taken into account when uh, designing. And in cyber guy. Of course, of course, of course. But it is so important, you know, to for you, for each one of us to have a look. This is online, so it's accessible online, and you can watch the scores uh, online. And this is really also very. A insightful educational tool uh, when we teach organized crime and when we conduct research uh, in organized crime. So this is my remark uh, on, on what we, very insightful presentations of John and Ugi that we just heard. So having said that, allow me to move to our next uh, panel discussion. Um, two representatives, two officers of the United Nations Office on drugs and crime um, will present about the teaching modules for corruption, integrity, and organized crime that have been developed by UNODC. Let me remind uh, the attendees um, that um, we had here at EPLO a round of uh, evaluation for the modules on integrity ethics. Uh, with Ugi and myself as uh, part of that process um, for developing the education for justice. That was part of the, so UNODC has the education for justice initiative. Uh, and as we will uh, most likely hear from Mr. Konstantin uh, Palikarski, regional anti-corruption advisor uh, of UNODC, now we have a new initiative, the GRACE initiative. So Mr. Palikarski, you have the floor to present UNODC's efforts um, um, in the field of anti-corruption education. Please, sir. Thank you. Um, dear colleagues, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the, for the floor and uh, thanks for uh, the very interesting presentations of the previous speakers. I think Ugi uh, um, grossly overestimates the um, how, how interesting my presentation will be. Actually, what we heard was indeed uh, very interesting, and uh, and and I would love to hear more about the index and about uh, how the methodology works to uh, to be able to compare so many different countries with so many different problems. Um, Allow me to start by thanking our hosts from um, the European Public Law Organization and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime um, for inviting UNODC to present our experience, our anti-corruption education-related uh, work in this important event. Uh, corruption, as we all know, is a global threat. It has not been a global threat 50 years ago or 100 years ago, corruption used to be uh, an issue of narrow national concern. If your public service was corrupt, if your uh, security services were corrupt, that, that, that made you a weaker country and then the stronger neighbor would take over. Uh, it was fairly simple. But nowadays, the world had globalized. And uh, what used to be a narrow national issue becomes a global concern. It is perfectly possible that um, a company from one country goes to another country, bribes a public official there who then exports the proceeds of crime to a third country, launders them in a fourth country and buys a house in a fifth country. And then in order to address that, we need international cooperation and we need a global framework. We need a global understanding 
of what corruption is, how we fight it, um, how we prevent it. And as it was already said in the beginning of our, um, of our meeting today, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption adopted in 2003 and in uh, force since 2005 is that global framework. It already has 189 states parties and um, that's 188 states parties plus the European Union. And um, UNODC serves as a secretariat to, um, to the conference of the six parties, which is the governing body of, um, of that instrument. And uh, um, we also provide technical assistance to states parties to implement the convention more effectively. So we are the guardians of the convention. And the, that global framework, the UN Convention Against Corruption, in its Article 13, um, focuses on the issues of anti-corruption education. And uh, it recognizes in, in paragraph one, uh, it requires states parties in paragraph one to promote active participation of individuals and groups outside the public sector in preventing and fighting against corruption. And then in subparagraph C, it continues, such participation can be strengthened through education programs in schools and universities. But uh, what, what does education program means? In essence, when we look at anti-corruption education, we speak about very different types of interventions because corruption is very different. Um, it, fr from, from an academic point of view, some academics argue about, uh, try, try to come up with, with a general definition of what corruption is. The conventions goes um, through a more legalistic, shall I say, approach, um, just listing offenses that are corruption, that is embezzlement, bribery, um, both in public and the private sector, abuse of office, trading and influence, obstruction of justice, money laundering, concealment. So these crimes are what we're trying to prevent. These crimes are what we, we are trying to detect, investigate effectively, um, punish and, and to that effect also cooperate internationally to return back the proceeds um, to the countries where they were stolen. Um, so there are different types of corruption. It is only logical um, that people see the corruption also differently depending on their role. Um, when they observe corruption, they could be witnesses. If they're involved, they're perpetrators. Um, if they're not involved, but they're just happy about it, then, then they're just a part of the overall society that needs to um, that, that, that needs to build some rules to make sure that corruption is easily detected and, and not easily perpetrated. So depending on the different types of corruption, depending on the different roles, in which recipients of training act, um, we need to develop different types of training, different types of education. Mr. Binis already spoke and um, he had a really excellent presentation on that, on the importance of ethics training, making sure that within the organizations, people know how they should behave, what, what are the um, principles that should guide their conduct, what are the rules that they should follow in a specific situation and then apply these rules to the specific situation and be able to to explain why they applied it that way ethics training very important and um, we already heard about the importance of training on how to report corruption and um, that is essentially a training for people who witness corruption and who need to know what they can do to take action. Um, there's also professional training, professional education that is extremely important. 
It is the training that we provide to police officers and to investigators so that they would know how to detect corruption, investigate it properly, training for judges to adjudicate properly cases of, of corruption. Um, oh, Anti-corruption education is a, a, a concept that really needs to be um, disaggregated when we speak about it. We, we need to know what precisely type of education we speak about. So what I will speak about today is um, the general training, general awareness raising related training uh, to strengthen the overall intolerance to corruption in the society, in schools, and academic training, which is looking at how we built in the university's capacity to, um, to research, which, which is essentially criminology. Um, it's very important to understand that corruption education is only one of the many elements that we need to have in place to make the anti-corruption framework work. Essentially, um, if, you, if, you, if you allow me a very uh, simplistic analogy, it's, it's like having a car. Huh? If you have uh, a gearbox that functions perfectly, but then everything else doesn't work, uh, continuing to fix the gearbox won't, won't do much help. Huh? You need also to fix the engine and to change the tires and, and so on. So it's important to understand that anti-corruption education is not a solution to all corruption problems, but it is an important element that can help. One uh, way of uh, describing how corruption happens at individual level was the model which was developed by Donald Cressy in 1953 that looks at, uh, at, at three factors which work together, uh, which need to be um, in place together in an individual's mind in order to, for, for corruption to happen. That's opportunity. I, can, I actually have access to the money so I can steal it. It's, uh, it's pressure or motivation, but essentially um, I, I'm a drug addict and I need money to buy drugs and rationalization. Rationalization is very important. Rationalization is that, um, it's, it's, it's the element that uh, the, we particularly uh, frequently encountered in, in, in white collar crime that allows the criminals to justify their actions so that they wouldn't call themselves criminals because people don't like to, to be called criminals, even if they are. And uh, they, they use different sorts of uh, justifications. Everyone does it. Huh? Well, it wasn't really a bribe. It was only a small gift. Or yes, I might have taken something, but look at that minister, only three months in office and he already bought a new house. So this type of rationalization um, is very important. And training, education helps to uh, reduce the likelihood of that rationalization happening. Uh, we, we understand that, that that's not okay. It's not just a, a gift, it is a bribe. Um, so this is the overall framework of the anti-corruption education in which we operate. Again, you notice he provides all these elements and types of, is involved in all these elements and types of anti-corruption education. I will speak now about um, what we do to introduce anti-corruption education in universities with uh, with few words also, I will, I will also say a few words about what we did to introduce um, anti-corruption education in primary and secondary schools. Since 2018, UNODC led the Anti-Corruption Academic Initiative, which was already mentioned, a collaborative project which uh, sought to encourage uh, um, teaching and research on anti-corruption by universities, high-level education institutions. And ACAT 
act as a central knowledge hub for those universities mm, with over 2,000 free online resources that could be accessed um, with a, a, a multidisciplinary model university course on the UN Convention Against Corruption, uh, which was translated in all official UN languages and um, is being taught in, in many universities around the world. And ACAT was also organizing an, uh, meetings, regional meetings, bringing together academics from the universities to uh, exchange experiences and learn from each other how to teach anti-corruption more effectively. That is the first initiative I wanted to mention historically. The second important initiative, which was also mentioned, is the Education for Justice, um, sometimes abbreviated as E4J. And that initiative started um, following the 13th Crime Congress in Doha. And um, it was aimed at helping the UN member states to implement the Doha Declaration. And E4J was an educational initiative which sought to prevent crime and promote culture of lawfulness uh, through education uh, to prevent, um, prevent crime including anti-corruption as an element of crime, but also many other sorts of crime. And um, to that effect, materials, training materials were developed on anti-corruption, ethics and integrity. And um, these materials were integrated into the primary, secondary and tertiary education levels. And then um, in the last, uh, uh, during during the last year, uh, the decision was taken to merge all those education initiatives that UNODC has been implementing through the years into um, what was designated as the GRACE Initiative, Global Resources for Anti-Corruption Knowledge Initiative. Um, the mission of GRACE is to create a culture of uh, rejection of corruption, um, and uh, it, um, it brings to the international community knowledge and experience working with teachers, academics, youth, anti-corruption authorities. Um, the importance of bringing partnerships nowadays is, is greater than ever. What we saw in the last two years, the, the impact of COVID, of the pandemic, the disruptive impact it had um, actually um, underlines even more the need for, for, for cooperation. GRACE provides the platform for that cooperation in the, um, in the area of um, education and youth engagement. Um, UNODC um, helps today's youth become the integrity leaders of tomorrow through through grace um, grace is empowering them with skills and mindsets required to promote transparency accountability and integrity within their communities um, the importance of training youth is obvious to to everyone here i mean you're all either teachers or or students professors um, Young people today are the future business people, are the future public officials, the future politicians. Uh, the importance of instilling the right set of values, uh, the importance of providing the knowledge and skills to recognize corruption, to know what to do when encountering it, uh, couldn't be couldn't be overestimated. Um, the priorities of which I spoke. These, these priorities are incorporated in GRACE through what is um, known as Youth-Led Integrity Advisory Board. It was launched earlier this year in 2022, and it consists of 25 young people from all over the world who work closely with UNODC, uh, sharing their views, ideas, experiences, and practices on how to engage youth in, um, in the anti-corruption efforts. Uh, GRACE is structured 
in three thematic pillars. Like E4J, we have primary and secondary education, we have academia and research, but we also have youth empowerment. And under each of these um, pillars, you know, to see develops tools um, to um, better understand and address corruption and other integrity related issues. Under the tertiary component of the GRACE initiative, we work with academics and uh, tertiary education institutions to promote practice oriented and interdisciplinary anti-corruption and ethics and integrity education, as well as research. Um, one tool that we helped develop in that respect and which is already being used by many universities are the module series on anti-corruption and on integrity and ethics. Each of these series consists of 14 modules. Um, the modules are multidisciplinary, they're interactive and adaptable to local cultural and uh, disciplinary contexts. Each module is designed as a three hour session that could be integrated into an existing course or trained uh, taught as a standalone workshop or further developed by, um, by the professors as a full course. Lecturers can also combine all 14 modules into a whole course on anti-corruption um, and integrity and ethics. The integrity and ethics modules, uh, two sets, huh? anti-corruption and integrity and ethics. The integrity and ethics modules focus on both general and applied areas of um, ethics and can be used either as ethics courses, standalone ethics courses, or as an ethics component of non-ethics courses. All modules are user-friendly. They were developed by um, renowned experts, academics, but uh, they still use non-technical language, and that makes them suitable for less experienced lecturers who wish to include anti-corruption integrity components into their teaching. Um, in our academic network, in the UNODC academic network, um, we have lecturers who use both module series in a wide range of disciplines, including law, political science, uh, business administration, and journalism, media, even medical studies and engineering courses. The modules are freely available online. Uh, you could access them through the GRACE website. And uh, they're accompanied by a teaching guide on integrity and ethics, which provides additional guidance, a very useful tool, particularly for less experienced um, lecturers. UNODC continues our work with the organization of um, with, with adaptation of our educational materials to different regional and cultural contexts. We do that by bringing together groups of experts in different parts of the world. And um, we're aware that the materials that we produce, although based on universal values, still need customization, still need to be adapted to the local legal context, in the local to the local culture context. Um, for example, in Cairo, we brought together experts from the MENA region um, and we worked together with them to adapt uh, the UNODC module series on anti-corruption to the local needs of universities in the MENA region. We also organized trainings for academics on how to use those materials. Um, we invite anti-corruption practitioners to those trainings and um, experts from ministries of education to discuss the teaching methodologies and the possible approaches to strengthening anti-corruption and integrity education nationally. We also look for opportunities to work with students directly by organizing various activities um, such as awareness raising events, student competitions to engage them directly in the anti-corruption efforts. This very brief overview um, is by necessity, well, very brief. <laughs> I would uh, encourage you to have a look at the UNODC website where you will find information both on E4J, which uh, the website of the initiative, though the initiative um, is formally over, is still operational 
and uh, you could you could check the information there. It's it's really interesting, but also the website of the, um, Grace Initiative that would provide you with up to date information on um, the activities um, Grace carries out in in your region. I would like to finish with a couple of words on what UNODC does in the region. Um, while we don't have many activities in Greece currently, we used to work together with Mr. Binis until literally um, the end of the last year in providing support to the NTA to implement the National Anti-Corruption Strategy. Um, that project is over, but we are very active in uh, the region of the Western Balkans. We provide support to the implementation of what is known as Regional Illicit Finance and Anti-Corruption Roadmap, a document adopted last year in Ohrid, North Macedonia, as a part of the Berlin process. Um, a document where governments from the region identified common challenges, common security and anti-corruption challenges, and certain common solution to address those challenges. UNODC acts as a secretariat to that roadmap, and it provides support to the governments in the region to implement that roadmap effectively, um, by extension also implementing the UN Convention Against Corruption, because the measures in the roadmap strongly correlate with, um, with, with the anti-corruption framework, with the corruption prevention framework of, art, of, of chapter two of the convention. Um, the roadmap is currently in its second year of implementation and we are now working with the governments in the region and also with the civil society to um, look at new challenges, to look at new opportunities to extend the anti-corruption work in the region. And um, we very much believe that the importance of anti-corruption education in that regard will be recognized. Um, thank you for your kind attention. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Palikarski, for this uh, very insightful presentation. Um, it goes without saying that UNODC um, offers the platform uh, and so much uh, knowledge as a knowledge hub um, for uh, us, so for uh, states worldwide and uh, universities and stakeholders to get this uh, uh, information, uh, to get these uh, courses, these model courses, and to make uh, good use of them in their respective um, jurisdictions. Um, myself and many colleagues here in the room were actively involved in the Education for Justice uh, program. And uh, I'm also currently involved uh, as we speak in the GRACE um, uh, program. Um, it is so important that we engage and that we educate our youth meaningfully uh, in our anti-corruption uh, efforts. And I think that there is a lot to be done in our region um, we must enhance uh, cooperation, we must build new networks, uh, and um, we must make sure that we move um, forward in terms of fighting uh, corruption and organized crime. Uh, when it comes to organized crime and UNODC, uh, our next speaker, uh, Mr. Bill Wood, is a regional organized crime advisor um, for uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And he will now join us online to present about uh, UNODC's uh, educational efforts uh, in this uh, field. So Mr. Hood, uh, you have the floor, sir. Uh, dear Chairman, thank you. And uh, greetings everybody from Skopje. I hope you can both hear me and see me well. Um, it's it, it's it's quite common for me to uh, to either follow Costa or precede Costa these days. We work very hand, very much hand in hand in the region. Uh, so my apologies to everybody that I'm not able to be sat next to Costa on stage and in front of you. Um, but obviously, as we know, this is the this is the second best option uh, that we have these days. Um, 
I'd like to share a screen with you and present you the UNODC teaching on organized crime. I have to say, I'm very pleased to hear you all talk about the synergy of organized crime and corruption, because as Costa has mentioned, the UNCAC, uh, of course, corruption is very much present in UNTOC, which I'll come on to, to mention. So let me share my screen now and hopefully. There we go. Hopefully that is uh, on slide one. Okay, so the UNODC teaching models module series has been developed to create and disseminate education materials on the issues of rule of law, crime prevention and criminal justice. The materials support educators to teach the next generation to better understand and address problems that can undermine the rule of law and encourage students to actively engage in their communities and future professions in this regard. UNODC worked directly with the academics and their universities, aiming to build a strong partnership with lecturers teaching at higher education institutions. The modules have been developed together with more than 600 academics from more than 110 countries. In result, there are more than 100 teaching models on eight different subject areas. And this means that in total, more than 5,000 pages of peer reviewed material are available online for free for academics interested in, the, in all of these topics. A range of teaching guides is also available online free of charge to help academics design and teach a course each of the eight subjects that you see on the slide. While modules on modules on organized crime, terrorism, firearms, cybercrime, trafficking in persons, smuggling of migrants, and wildlife crime are available on UNODC Sherlock portal, teaching models on integrity and ethics and anti-corruption are part of the GRACE initiative that has already been mentioned and discussed. As the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, UNTOC, is the only international legally binding document on organized crime, the modules on organized crime are built upon the key provisions of UNTOC. So these include definitions, criminalization of the commission of organized crime, main markets and activities of organized, crime, organized criminal groups, evolving models of organized criminal groups, as well as key responses to the problem, including law enforcement tools, prosecution strategies, and reflections related to sentencing and confiscation, as well as key international cooperation provisions. Since facilitating international cooperation is indeed the key objective of the UN Convention. Furthermore, specific modules dealing with cross-cutting issues such as gender and organized crime, as well as linkages between organized crime and other forms of criminal activities, such as terrorism and cybercrime. The modules can be used as standalone teaching resources. Basically, professors can use them to build a course on organized crime specifically, or they can be used as a means of enhancing already existing courses in criminology, law, political science, international relations, sociology, and many other disciplines. Such a pick and choose approach allows lecturers interested in a specific topic, to pick up one of the modules and integrate it in the ongoing courses, depending on their needs. All modules provide content for a three hour class and all follow the same structure. That means in class exercises, student assessments, slides, and other additional teaching tools that lecturers can adapt to their programs. I can't go into all sections of the modules, but I hope after this presentation, you will browse through the modules yourselves, um, particularly if you are brand new to this um, Sherlock portal. What I would like to leave you with is an idea of the type of content we include in these modules, and in particular, the case studies we make available to professors 
for them to use in class and make teaching on organized crime more engaging. Furthermore, I'd, I'd like to mention this uh, video that we've created, um, a self-paced e-learning course, which is based on the module series, and it takes approximately 90 minutes. Um, of course, that's 90 minutes if you watch it non-stop from start to finish. Uh, and it does issue a certificate of completion after finalization and passing a final test. And as you can see, it's available in English, French, and Spanish. So before I finish, uh, and you'll be ready then, I think, for a lunch break and looking at the agenda, I'd just like to uh, leave you with an idea of the type of content, uh, sorry, um, a case study, um, which, will, which we've used in classes to stimulate discussions around organized crime topics. Uh, and this one has worked particularly well. So this is the case of the Ivory Queen. Uh, Yang Fen Feng Glan, AKA the Ivory Queen, an elderly Chinese woman, probably not most people's idea of the leader of an organized criminal group. Nonetheless, Tanzanian authorities arrested and charged her with leading one of Africa's biggest ivory smuggling rings, responsible for trafficking the tusks of more than 350 elephants worth 13 billion shillings, which equates to $5.6 million US, illegally leaving Tanzania for Asia. Tanzania's National and Transnational Serious Crimes Investigation Unit tracked her for more than a year, which is an important point to note when you consider legislation on special investigation techniques, in particularly in the Western Balkans. So tracked her for more than a year, and she was arrested in October 2015 following a high-speed car chase. In February of 2019, a Tanzanian trial court found her guilty and sentenced her to 15 years in prison. She was convicted on the same charges as two other individuals thought to be key to the smuggling ring. Furthermore, the court ordered the confiscation of the buildings used for the illegal operations and imposed a fine, which doubled the estimated value of the ivory trafficked. The defendants appealed the sentence on several grounds, questioning the testimony provided by the personnel and the evidence of the trafficked ivory produced in the courtroom. However, the appeal was dismissed in October of 2019. Such a case in the modules is accompanied by supporting documentation as well as a discussion question that can be used by professors with their students. And I hope you agree, it's a great example for many, many teaching aspects. In this case, as well as many other resources related to organized crime, you can find them on Sherlock, which is the portal created by UNODC to facilitate the dissemination of information regarding the implementation of the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, and of course, its three protocols. This includes legislation, casework, bibliography, national strategies, and much more relevant to the fight against organized crime around the world. I hope that's been useful, brief, perhaps even briefer than Costa was, but I'm very pleased to have joined you, even albeit online, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Hood, uh, for presenting um, UNODC's uh, programs and projects and platforms uh, for education uh, against uh, transnational organized crime. All this is very useful for us uh, teachers of such courses. And this is also uh, awareness raising material as well. So it's not 
just for teachers, and it's not just for educators, but it is for the public as well. Uh, it is uh, for everyone who has received education in the past in a related field. So this must be said. Um, I think we are very well uh, on time uh, for our uh, lunch break uh, today. Um, we will resume our works uh, at uh, two o'clock at the quarter past two. So 14 hours, 15, we will meet again here. Um, to continue with the presentation of anti-corruption uh, master courses offered and delivered by the International Anti-Corruption Authority. Uh, there is a change uh, in our agenda, and let me allow me to draw your attention to this. Um, because our panelists uh, from, the, from Transparency International Greece are traveling to Athens uh, from Thessaloniki, uh, we will move uh, the presentation of my book on organized crime to, 40, to, to 14 hours 45, so a quarter to three o'clock. So this will take um, the space of uh, Transparency International and we will swap slots with Transparency International. So the presentation of, uh, of my book on organized crime with Professor Artinopoulou will take place at 2 o'clock 45. Uh, Ugi, please. I don't uh, want to keep you uh, long before, but I just wanted to make one uh, 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 to pass on the information regarding what uh, Costa uh, presented, particularly regarding corruption uh, and ACAD. And we have organized for South, South, Southeastern European region, uh, our ACAD, the regional branch. And we have uh, here a uh, few members of ACAD, Dimitri, Sunchana, Ivana, Alban, Milos. Uh, uh, and we had up to now three or four meetings uh, in, in presence. We had one in Tirana that Alba has hosted. We had one in Slovenia that Vasilika uh, has co-hosted. Then we had two online because there was this <laughs> COVID. And it was an implementation of uh, ACAD in this region. And I must say that uh, we should be very proud that we have it. It's a very active ACAD. Now maybe we will change the name into Grace. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> but... Uh, but uh, this is an important network for the teachers to exchange uh, uh, to exchange all, all these experiences. And actually, we will see uh, tomorrow in particular people from this network and from the organized crime uh, groups, uh, what is their teaching experience and to what extent um, <clears throat> UNODC, both organized crime and corruption and ethics uh, and integrity modules can be used for teaching. I myself am using them. And what is the beauty of this is that we are free to combine them in whatever way we think is the best, right? You don't have to stick it. You can combine corruption module with the organized crime module with integration module. What Bill was referring to as a case study, you can choose your own case study from your country and the region, right? Instead of ivory, lady, but that was a good example how you can build in case studies. So I think this was extremely important and I am most thankful to UNODC for the work and of course to Costa and Bill for, for, for this presentation. If I may add, um, Ambassador Svekic, um, it is important and it, this is just an idea for UNODC. For us implementing uh, those model courses in our universities, it would be so nice because uh, Bini spoke um, before about professional certification and professional education. Since, you know, this is the gateway into professional actually education because the students of today are the compliance officers and the anti-corruption officers and administrators of tomorrow. It would be so nice if UNODC would acknowledge the use of those tools in, in our universities and possibly issue some kind of certifications for the students who have uh, attended these courses or organize something or, or support the organization of something similar to the summer uh, school that we just heard 
uh, by the regional uh, anti-corruption initiative. Uh, this would underline that the students, that all these regional cohorts of students were educated on the basis uh, of these uh, tools and have been possibly examined on the basis of these tools. And what a better way, I mean, afterwards we, we have to pay for professional certifications like, you know, anti, uh, like uh, certified fraud examiners and so on and auditors, blah, 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 blah. And this is for free. This is offered by UNODC for free. This is offered by our universities to our students. So this would be a nice way to underline um, that this is education um, in practice. This is education for real life. And this is education for, uh, we don't just talk, we walk the talk of anti-corruption and, and fighting organized crime. So this is just a, a, an idea to take back home and we will be in close cooperation to see how we move forward. And maybe from uh, Ayaka, yes, please. This is also a concept for IACA. Yes, which uh, is... actually uh, I have also developed a course not yet implemented. Uh, especially meant for the alumni of Payaka, because they actually the whole master's program is not meant just to learn something and sit back. But we have developed a course which is called trainers training, or I called it E to E, educate to educate, basically, from E4J. The con the content will be what E4J has, but the whole certi it, the per people who will be trained because the main problem is of they are there if they are already lecturers in the university they know how to teach. But the professionals, they have great expertise, but they do not know how to teach. So we are going to tell this course has been designed, not yet implemented. I think Qatar is was funding it. It's still with them whether they accept it or not is different because E4J is also supported by Qatar. So that the people who are in uh, practice, they should know how to teach. So course was designed as an experiment that three modules will be taken and the people will be first trained online with just like we do our master's program, every content available. And then they come to Ayaka and in presence of a lecturer who is who was supposed to be the E4J champions, we were, we were I was in touch with UNODC, if they can provide someone, they will supervise even during the uh, self-study phase for a month, they develop the course and they teach each other. And then we see how, how they perform. I think the idea is that to, to take this E4J resources ahead now, maybe with more, you know, how people integrate their courses. I mean, lectures, it is, you, uh, UNODC is already doing it. They are going to different places and in, asking the lecturers to integrate, but how to make the practitioners teach. And that will be a great resource because practitioners has a great you know, they, they are prosecutors, they are anti-corruption experts. They can also bring a lot of resources in academic field. So I think this is, I hope it works, but I think we have to take, take it further. Thank you. Just to follow up on this, it would not be necessary or for UNODC in a sense, but basically on some kind of master ed prepared by UNODC, all those who are using all the teachers, the university, et cetera, that are using the modules could use this master ed in order to release the certificate to the students. So this is a way to facilitate things in order not to have a centralized thing, but to have the various subs that are uh, can, uh, uh, on the basis of the completion of the course, et cetera, release the certificate. This is the first point. The second point is the question of the alumni, which was raised by our friend Power. Uh, uh, this is a very important thing. Uh, yeah. As a, a, a member of the Board of Governors of the Academy, first uh, and, and for some period also as a chairman of the Board of Governors, uh, um, I had the opportunity not only of uh, uh, following the curriculum and the teaching and uh, and the being part uh, in the defense thesis of uh, of, of the students, uh, but also of of me following and meeting some of them uh, 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 and being associated with some of the summer uh, meeting of the alumni of uh, of, uh, of of Yaka. 
And this is a, a, using the, all this network of the alumni as potential teacher, not only practitioners, as the idea of Pawan mentioned now, is really something that should be further explored. Uh, we have, uh, for example, another example, in addition to Yaka, is uh, uh, the, 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 the UNAFE in, uh, uh, in Japan uh, uh, is mainly on, uh, on crime prevention and criminal justice and is mainly for the Asian region. But UNAFE has extended its service basically to all countries of the world, because in addition to the Asian region, very often uh, there are many participants from uh, uh, many developing countries, etc. And, uh, and, uh, and, and they maintain this network of alumni uh, uh, through uh, uh, um, seminars, uh, through contacts, uh, through newsletters, et cetera, et cetera, so as to maintain the links between UNAFE and uh, uh, keeping them informed of the various activities and the various training courses that UNAFE is organizing every year. And at the same time, having the feedback from them of what they have been doing in their own countries when these uh, things have been finished. I think this is, a, 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 in a sense, to, 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 to stress the importance of a kind of mutual feedback between uh, those who are uh, providing uh, the, the models and the courses and the ideas, those who are receiving, and uh, how the the, 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 the the interaction between all this can continue to work in the future. Um, thank you, Powan, and, th and thank you, Eduardo. I can't agree more. Um, um, the next phase would be to train the trainers and to, and to prepare uh, new trainers. And if these trainers are already working within organizations as alumni, I'm an alumnus and IACA alumnus myself, uh, with a very strong network. Now we, uh, IACA will be doing uh, the Asian uh, round uh, where uh, parallel uh, the alumni uh, will meet. So it is important uh, for IACA, for example, to be able to identify a few leaders or good educators within this group of people, within this pool, to educate the others and to make sure that we spread uh, these uh, educator skills in our uh, community, because then these people will be able, for example, in the private or in the public sector to organize internal house seminars for anti-corruption, for fighting organized crime, and so on and so on. So, so this is the way to do it and decentralize. Uh, I, I fully agree with you, uh, Eduardo, about how such certification, for example, can be decentralized. And once UNODC has identified those partners who are already educated and have been validated, uh, so to say, you know, true educators in, in the field, then this can be done easily. And this is added value for uh, for our attendees and for civil society as a whole. I couldn't uh, agree more. Uh, and I think this is um, a very nice way uh, to finish uh, this first session of, of today, because you see how much knowledge and how much expertise and how many very nice, uh, fruitful ideas uh, are shared uh, in this uh, room. So um, we will now uh, have our lunch break. Uh, and we will meet uh, back. Uh, I think uh, those uh, uh, 45 minutes are enough. Uh, and we will meet again in 45 minutes uh, in this room, uh, if this is uh, fine with all of you. So thank you very much. And free time for the next 45 minutes. Hey.